this field, which is where sure. the, the crop it crosses the, the, the whole system crosses the railroad tracks. And right down there, they had to actually had their plant, and then they, and they get, have to get onto the freeway. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's like an odd place for it. But I mean, they think get access to both sides of the freeway probably that way. But a little scary about how they have to get on right onto the freeway. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the final day of April of 2013. I hope all of you are enjoying this record heat as well as I am. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, great to have so many folks here this morning. I know the reason why you're here is because of the service award presentations, and that's a great uh, thing that the county does, and we're so honored to have everyone with us this morning. We're going to begin the morning with a Pledge of Allegiance followed by the moment of silence, and we will be led by our supervisor from District 4, Steve Worthley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ready? Salute. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we have several county employees that are working towards this, and uh, maybe they will, uh, hopefully they will get there uh, someday. But our first item on the agenda today uh, is item number one, and that's to recognize Chief Ted Mendoza from the fire department upon his retirement and many years of county service. Um, so right now I would like to call up uh, Chief Joe Garcia uh, to make a few comments uh, to Chief Mendoza, and then we will uh, follow that up with a presentation of the uh, plaque and uh, some photos and we'll move on with the service awards. Good morning Mr. Chairman, members of the boards, CAO, County Council. I'm glad to be here today uh, to witness the board recognizing Chief Ted Mendoza for his many years of service not only to the citizens of Tulare County but as well to the citizens of the state of California. Chief Mendoza uh, will have 39 years in the fire service arena, which is quite exemplary. He actually started uh, his career as a seasonal firefighter with CDF at that point in time, which is now known as Cal Fire, and progressed through the ranks working in various counties in his career. From, from uh, 19... Let's see here. From 1989 to 1999, he actually worked here in Tulare County and served the citizens of California for 10 years uh, while working for CDF as in various uh, uh, positions, if you will, including battalion chief of various areas, Pixley, you know, uh, and uh, so consequently, in 2006, when uh, you folks decided to form the Tulare County Fire Department, he was one of the individuals that was chosen as being instrumental and being a master of his craft in operations and came to work as a fire division chief for Tulare County Fire Department. He has been uh, indispensable to the former fire chief as he has been indispensable to me. He has spent uh, 10 years uh, 
working with Cal Fire in Tulare County, and he spent seven years working with the new Tulare County Fire Department in many, many, uh, in many areas that allowed us to not only develop, not only create, but develop the fire department to the degree that it has become. So consequently, he has 32 years with Cal Fire and seven years with the Larry County Fire Department. But I can tell you that when we speak about somebody leaving and we say that they're going to be irreplaceable, uh, for the most part, many times that is just an idiom that we use, words that we say. In this particular case, he is a man of many talents and he will be truly be <coughs> irreplaceable. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the honor that you bestow on him. Yeah, th thank you very much, Chief, for your presentation. And I'd like to now call Chief Mendoza to come up and join us here in the front. Uh, and I will present him with his uh, plaque. You know, it's pretty rare that I feel underdressed, but you guys should put yourself <laughs> together real nice. Uh, I feel underdressed in these chambers only very uh, rarely, and uh, that's typically because I have a fat neck and go with just a sport coat and no tie, and all these guys wear ties. So uh, it's sure nice to stand next to you fine-looking gentlemen this morning uh, to present you with this uh, plaque and uh, county seal in recognition of your, your service to the county. Now, I, I figured I would mention this before my colleagues have the chance. Uh, but 39 years is a really long time. Um, I don't even know that length of time yet. Um, but I, I'm really, really proud to, to say that I, I proudly represent you, as I know you live in Tulare. Um, and it's been really a pleasure to work with you and uh, really learn so much about the fire department and what they do because of your willingness to share with me and be a part of uh, our roles as supervisors in, in representing the communities. and. Um, the role of the fire department. And I really appreciate all the time and effort that you put in, and I hope that this will be more than a coaster uh, to you and, and will be hung on your wall proudly. Um, and may the, really the best years of your life be ahead of you, Chief, because uh, 39 years is a long time, but you don't look old enough yet to uh, just sit on a couch and do nothing. So uh, may the best years of your life truly be ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, if I might, uh, Ted, before you leave the building, uh, um, I guess as uh, sort of the class historian here, since I'm one that was around, we created a new fire department, and I remember Chief Sunderland, uh, you were high on his list to come on board as helping form the, the new fire department, which has been an unparalleled success. And I personally want to thank you for being the interim chief after Chief Sunderland retired and before our current chief came on board. You were very uh, helpful to us and not afraid to speak your mind and uh, I, I very much appreciate your friendship your candor and your service to Tulare County and to the people of Tulare County and to the state of California and I too wish you the very best in your years ahead thank you very much Ted uh, last Friday evening we swore in six new lieutenants for the County Fire Department which prompted me to look on my wall and look up the date of when the fire when we swore all the the new fire department in and it will be six years in june and in that short period of time and you started even before we had a fire department but in that short period of time i can say with i'm sure with the rest of the board of supervisors we're darn proud of what you've accomplished and our county fire department has accomplished in that short period of time we're, cer we're certainly going to miss you. Uh, I want to say that you're really a class act. So best of luck to you in the future. Chairman? Well, uh, gosh, time flies, doesn't it? Uh, 
course, I can remember back to uh, like Supervisor Sheet was saying. I went to the when we had the testing out there at the Newcomb Station uh, Fire Station in Porterville City Fire Station. We had the testing was uh, seeing what you guys really do and seeing what how the shape you've got to be in. I mean, to me, it's amazing. Uh, it really is amazing to watch these guys train and, and do all the things that they do. So. I uh, really appreciate your efforts in putting this county fire department together. Uh, I think you were a big part of that, and uh, you're a great guy, and, and really enjoyed working with you over the years, talking to you. You got a lot of knowledge in that head, so keep going forward and keep yourself busy. I know you will, but thanks again for all your service. You are very well appreciated by this supervisor, and I know by this board. Thank you. One, one of the things uh, I know is rare is to be able to be a part of creating a new fire company, a new fire department, and we were, we are the recipients of all of your many years of knowledge, being able to come in and work with that original team and put our fire department together, job well done. And enjoy your retirement, thank you. May I take Absolutely. Sure, Chief, absolutely. Sorry for, <laughs> sorry for not giving you that opportunity earlier. Pull, pull, pull. Just go ahead and grab the microphone and pull it towards you. There you go. I'm not sure which way to face, face you or face the audience. Uh, supervisors, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve here in Tulare County. I want to thank you for that, that period of time that I served as your interim fire chief. Thank you for putting your trust in me. But I, I can tell you that it was really pretty easy, um, and I'll tell you why. It, it wasn't because of my skills or talents. You have... A, a, I'm leaving, okay? I'm not promoting, I'm not, I don't want any, Jake, I don't need a discount, I'm, I'm not building anything, okay? I'm not looking for anything. But you, you, you need to hear from people that have, have no vested interest. There's a world of, of information out here, world of cooperation, world of, of teamwork that goes on between all the departments. I, uh, I did serve you. In all the capacities that I served here from 1989 until uh, 2000, I left just before the Y2K deal happened and I went to Fresno to work. So I worked in, but in each one of those capacities, I was serving to Larry County as the Pixley Battalion Chief, as your communications chief dispatching both state and county resources in the uh, Woodlake Battalion where I was uh, overseeing the Ivanhoe Fire Station along with the volunteers at Woodlake and up at Badger. So in all of my capacities, I always served Tulare County in one way or another. But never then did I ever interact as much with the other county departments as I did now, obviously because we have more personnel, we had a greater budget responsibility and other things. But all of the folks out here, the, the people from IT, the people from RMA Roads Department, there were concerns in the beginning about how things would work at the RMA Road Yard because there were some suspicions that the fire mechanics the equipment was always beautiful and running and, and there would be downtime and they'd be sitting around having coffee while the other mechanics were working. And we, Steve Nolan and I were able to work through all those things. And time and time again, every office I ever worked with, you have great cooperative people and, and they are what made our job easy. They are what made us able to get the department to where it went. It wasn't by ourselves. Gene Rousseau and all the support that he's given us. He has limited dollars, he helps as best he can with what he can do, but they have just like you have. And so with all that said, I don't want to take up any more airtime except to say thank you all very much. And all the friends that I've made in the other departments, thank all of you. I'm sorry I can't mention everybody because we're limited for time, but thank you all. Great job, Chief. You will definitely be missed, and I think that's a fantastic segue to the next item on our agenda, which is our service award presentations. We do have so many great people, um, and this is one day each year. Well, it actually happens two separate days because it's two separate weeks. We can't get everyone in at one meeting, but um, very special days for us as a board to recognize the employees in Tulare County that are dedicated and committed not only to serving uh, the constituents of Tulare County, but being a part of Tulare County, you are really uh, the face of who we are and you make this county possible and you make this county function. So uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Cardell to uh, run the uh, service award presentations. Well, good yep. morning, Chairman and members of the board. It, it gives me great pleasure today to assist you with recognizing employees for their uh, long service and dedication to the county. As you know, the service award program recognizes employees who have completed 10 or more years of continuous service during the prior calendar year. 
We honor these employees for their loyalty, their hard work, and, their, and the valuable continuity and historical memory they provide to their departments and the citizens of this county. Awards for employees who have completed 10 years of service are presented within the respective employees' departments. Today, beginning with 15 years of service and for completion of each five years of additional service, the, boards are, the awards are presented by your board. Today, we will be recognizing 47 employees who possess over 900 years of service in the county. Wow. Tw 25 of today's awards are for 15 years Double of service, nine are for 20 years, eight for 25 years, one for 30, three for 35 years, and we have one for 40 years of service to Tulare County. Recipient says, your name is called today. Please come forward to receive your award and um, our staff will assist you with collecting your award and the supervisors will be coming up by district uh, to give you your or provide you with your award as well. We'll start with District 1 and Supervisor Rashida. So uh, we will start with Betsy Ellis from Health and Human Services Agency. Betsy uh, has indicated that she's all about her family. She's been married for 11 years and has a seven-year-old boy. She en enjoys dirt bike riding, water skiing, and camping. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next recipient for 15 years of service, also from uh, HHSA, is Sean Graves. Sean? Sean has uh, indicated that he's published two books. I'd like to know more about that. Uh, he's a pat proud um, parent of four children, two daughters-in-law, and has two grandsons. She, sorry. Happens <laughs> opposite. <laughs> Our next recipient this morning is uh, John Lee from the District Attorney's Office with 15 years of service. John has previously worked uh, 13 years in the uh, Sheriff's Department, has most recently uh, joined the DA's office a couple of years ago. He enjoys scuba diving and was the 2007 Sexual Assault Investigator of the Year. From HHSA, celebrating 20 years of service, Anita Bivian. Anita is a recent graduate of our Supervisory Academy. Her, um, she indicates that she's very proud of her parents who were farm workers. They provided her the best education by teaching respect and a strong work ethic. Congratulations, Anita. Celebrating 25 years of service from HHSA, Melissa Powell. Melissa has indicated that she enjoys uh, crafts, specifically scrapbooking and quilting, making hats for cancer patients as well. She's the grandmother of a nine-year-old and, um, and a six-year-old as well. Her supervisor indicates that she makes great contributions to the unit. Congratulations, Melissa. Celebrating 25 years of service, Christine Ward from HHSA. Christine recently took a three-week car tour of the East Coast. <coughs> She's been married for 32 years to her wonderful husband and is the proud mommy to David, Anna and Grady. Celebrating 35 years of service from the Resource Management Agency, Roger Hunt. Roger began his uh, service with Larry County as an extra help engineering aide in 1972. He's been married for 32 years, and his first grandchild was born in November of last year. <laughs> District 2.
We begin in District 2 with Daniel Biggs from HHSA. Daniel is celebrating 15 years of service, has an Associate of Arts degree in Social Science, and is also a State Park docent. Congratulations, Daniel. Also celebrating 15 years of service in HHSA, Efren Rodriguez. He's been assigned to Tulare Works uh, since 1999. He enjoys cycling, skiing, and hunting. He's been uh, recognized as a valuable asset and a team player. Congratulations, Efren. <laughs> also celebrating 15 years of service is Rocio Rodriguez. Rocio loves to bake and also likes to read. She has three kids that are her world. Her supervisor says that for more than 10 years, in all the years, she's been a, a joyful employee. Also celebrating 15 years of service, Clemencia Shear. Okay. Um, <laughs> Clemencia has um, one year of college. She has a certificate of excellence. Excellence. Um, it's okay. She enjoys volleyball, softball, and spending time with her family. Congratulations, Clemencia. <laughs> also celebrating 15 years of service, Marco Valenzuela. Is Marco here? Oh, there he is. Okay. Okay. Um, Marco is, uh, enjoys teaching kids boxing and is a proud parent of his first daughter in July 2011. Yes. Yes. Um, Elkie Smith, also celebrating 15 years of service. In 2008, Elke took and passed the California Department of Veterans Affairs accreditation exam. She's the proud grandparent of two wonderful grandsons, one-year-old and six-year-old. One more for District 2, Vidalina Mendonca. Mendonca, celebrating 35 years of service. She indicates that her hobbies are riding the motor motorcycle with her husband and friends and, in and enjoying going to different lakes on boats. Her supervisor indicates that she's a hardworking employee who exemplifies detail work and the ability to follow through on assigned tasks. Congratulations. <laughs> So in District 3, we're celebrating cumulatively over 360 years of county service. And beginning with Amelia Armas, celebrating 15 years of service. She currently works as a senior account clerk in general services. She received Employee of the Month in December 2010 and is the secretary of the Tulare County Latino Rotary. Also celebrating 15 years of service, Guy Christian. Guy used, uh, Guy used to work in the uh, fraud unit in the DA's office. He's the president of the California Welfare Fraud Investigators Association, has four children, 11 grandchildren, and is the great, will be a great grandfather in seven months. Congratulations. The next recipient for uh, 15 years of service is Melissa Cohen. 
In 2000, Melissa obtained her psychology license and worked as a psychologist too. She's worked as a conservative conservatorship investigator for the county. Also celebrating 15 years of service, Margie, Margie Flores from Health and Human Services Agency. Also celebrating 15 years of service, <clears throat> Sheila Howland. Sheila's the grandmother of eight and a great grandmother of one. She's also the most highly productive, organized, and dedicated, one of the most highly productive, organized, and dedicated employees at the Visalia Adult Clinic. From the DA's office, Jennifer Lightfoot is celebrating 15 years of service. She has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, a paralegal certificate, and is a certified crisis responder through the National Organization of Victim Assistance. She's been married for 12 years and has two children. Congratulations. <laughs> Carolyn Wrench is also celebrating 15 years of service. She's indicated she enjoys reading, gardening, being with her pets, and going to plays with friends. <laughs> celebrating 15 years of service, Lori Welch. Lori enjoys music, reading, uh, teaching Sunday school, and assisting clients. Her supervisor indicates that she's a team player, has shown a dedication to clients we serve, and inspires that and her staff. <laughs> Celebrating 20 years of service, Kristen Bennett. Kristen began her employment in 1992 as an administrative analyst. She's been commended by the board for completing construction of uh, facilities on time and under budget, including the Tulare County Youth Facility, Juvenile Detention Facility, Dinubal Justice Facility, and Tulare County Ag Building. She was recently appointed the, uh, the department head for the Capital Projects and Facilities Department. Mona McCann is celebrating 20 years of service as well. Mona has a bachelor's degree in journalism and public relations. She loves to travel, mainly to visit her grandchildren. Congratulations. <laughs> Umaro Ortiz is celebrating 20 years of service. He's completed the Tulare County Supervisory Academy and is a proud parent of five children and nine grandchildren. He loves vacationing in Las Vegas with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating 25 years of service, Joel Martins. Joel is a registered environmental health specialist, a registered hazardous substance professional, a California UST inspector, and a hazmat technician. He's been recognized for outstanding environmental leadership. At 25 years of service, Tim Mathis. Tim has a BS in accounting from Fresno Strait, go dogs. Um, <laughs> He's often found in the office break room leading a group singing in Kumbaya and discussing the benefits of working for Tulare <laughs> County. <laughs> Congratulations, Tim. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Uh, Anne Marie Sparks celebrating 25 years of service.
She's a self-sufficiency supervisor. Her supervisor indicates that she is dedicated to serving the residents of Tulare County as a team player, works hard, and is a pleasure to work with. Congratulations. <laughs> Celebrating 30 years of service, Eric Velasquez. Eric actually began his career in the Sheriff's Department and is now currently with the District Attorney's Office as an investigator. He's worked in assignments such as jail, patrol, SWAT, narcotics, and the clandestine lab team and violent crimes. Congratulations. <laughs> Celebrating 35 years of service, Roxana Ross. Currently works as a program specialist for IHSS. She enjoys reading and bicycle riding. Congratulations. Celebrating 40 years of service to the county, Jim Waters from HHSA. What the 40 year gift looks like. <laughs> Jim has been the Environmental Quality Division Coordinator since 1990. Prior to that, he worked for Environmental Health Division for 18 years, has a master's degree in biological science, and is a registered environmental health specialist. He's been blessed with a wonderful family. Congratulations. <laughs> We'll now be recognizing employees who reside in District 4. With 15 years of service, Leonard Encinas, Jr. Leonard is the proud father of four wonderful children and so enthused with his granddaughter, Carly. Supervisor indicates that he's been an asset to the unit and has made his job as a supervisor a lot easier. Congratulations. Also celebrating 15 years of service, Olga Garibay. Olga has worked for Tulare Works in Lindsay, Dinuba, Visalia, and the Processing Center. She loves cake de decorating and floral arrangements. She's a proud mother of three and grandmother of one. Also celebrating 15 years of service from the Sheriff's Department, Harold Lillis. <laughs> he started his career in 1997. He's, a, he's completed the Sherman Block Leadership Academy in 2012 and received certification as a narcotics expert and clandestine lab expert. Betty Scruggs, also celebrating 15 years of service, has her master's in social work. Her supervisor asks, says, thank you for your hard work and dedication in the field of elder abuse. <laughs> celebrating 15 years of service as well is Jaime Zuniga. Jaime has worked all 15 years at Tulare Works Division of the county and has been the volunteer of the year for the Dinuba Police Department. <laughs> Nibor Gomez is celebrating 20 years of service. He's the proud parent of a career serviceman in the United States Air Force greatly enjoys working for the county. His supervisor indicates that the energy with which he approaches every day serves to inspire many. <laughs> also celebrating 20 years of service, Mary Huerta. You've got a knife. 
watch out. <laughs> She's a graduate also of the, uh, the County Supervisory Academy. She has a wonderful husband, five children, and four grandchildren with another on the way. <laughs> Vicki Montoya is celebrating 20 years of service. No? We wish her well. Margaret Venegas celebrates 20 years of service. Margaret has been an OA2, an account clerk, and an eligibility worker. She says that family time is very important to her. Her supervisor indicates that she is a team player, always assisting where needed. <laughs> Celebrating 25 years of service, Elizabeth Morales. Elizabeth uh, had a special assignment uh, where she represented Tulare County as a disaster relief social worker after the Santa Cruz earthquake to provide services to displaced elderly and disabled individuals. Congratulations. <laughs> and the last in District 4, Angelina Stanfield, celebrating 25 years of service. She completed the, cat, the 2009 Class of Leadership of Northern Tulare County. She's also a member of uh, Danuba Kiwanis. <laughs> On to District 5. <clears throat> Celebrating 15 years of service, Teodorico de, de Leon. Has been a uh, Self-sufficiency support assistant since 1997. His supervisor indicates he is a great resource to staff and awesome at resolving problems. About 15 years of service for Gabriela Leva. Gabriela enjoys baking with her family. She's been married for 15 years and has two daughters. Her supervisor indicates that Gabrielle is very knowledgeable in the medical programs, so she has always been an excellent resource for me and her peers. <laughs> also celebrating 15 years of service, Terry Sprague. Terry started in the HHSA uh, Children's Unit and transferred to the DA's office in Porterville. She's completed the Supervisory Academy and is becoming a grandparent is the, of the role of her life. Karen Hansen, celebrating 20 years of service. Karen received her Master's in Public Administration degree in 2004. She enjoys vacationing in Maui, Hawaii. And last but certainly not least, uh, Judy McCullough is celebrating 25 years of service. She is the grandmother to one grandson, five years old, and one granddaughter, seven years old. She's currently a training officer, too, in Health and Human Services Agency. Does that conclude your presentation, Mr. Cardell? That concludes I'd, I, our presentation, Mr. Chair. I would like to have, before everyone heads out real quick, I want to give each of the board members an opportunity to say a few words if they would like uh, about today's recipients and about our employees. So, Supervisor Sheeta, would you like to start? Chief uh, Mendoza said something that was very important, and that is the cooperation between all the departments. And we've been able to accomplish a lot because of the cooperation between uh, the leadership in all various departments. One of them that comes to mind is the realignment of prisoners. It uh, was the most recent one, and it takes cooperation of all your departments. But more than that, with the amount of years that you have and the positions that you hold, you are the backbone of Tulare County. And we certainly appreciate your years of service, 
and the expertise and your dedication to the county. So thank you very much. President. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Uh, thank you for all your years of service. You know, it, uh, you're the people that are out there every day. You're in the trenches. You're meeting the people. You're making this county run. And you're the most important part of this county is the employees because they make it up. Just like any business, there's a name on that business. Our business is Tulare County, but you are Tulare County, and we appreciate every one of you and what you do on a daily basis for Tulare County. Thank you so much. Mr. Wardley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, oftentimes we confuse things, and uh, one of the things that strikes me is we talk about a church. What is a church? And many people think of a building with a steeple on it. But we know that the church is actually the people who make up the, the body. In much the same way, I think, in county government, uh, we tend to look at edifices, buildings, and so forth, assets of that nature, and we think of that being the county. But really, the county is you. The people who work for our county are the backbone, as was mentioned before, but more than the backbone, they are the heart and soul of, of our county. And whatever we accomplish as a county together, it's because of all of you. My hope for you is that you find your work rewarding, that you find opportunities to express yourself, your opportunities to, to uh, learn, to grow, uh, to share uh, what you have. Your knowledge is so very important that we really want to access that. Uh, I can't compare you with other counties because I only know ours, but I have to believe you've got the smartest group of people at work for Tulare <laughs> County. And I really do thank you for your years of service. I look forward to many more years uh, because, um, you know, what's, you know, work is important. I think it, it's a big part of our lives. And, and uh, I, I, again, I hope you enjoy what you're doing. And uh, if you haven't found a place you really like in Tulare County, look around because we have lots of opportunities to, to move and grow in other areas. So thank you again. Professor Cox. I have to check Mr. Cardell's math, as always. <laughs> <laughs> I count 885 years, so maybe I, I dropped a, a, you know, one or two folks off of this. But still, 900 years, that is so impressive. Each year as we do this and I count up the number of years of service, um, it just amazes me at the level of dedication that you have in giving so much of yourself to the county and so much of yourself to the citizens of Tulare County. So. From my heart, I deeply appreciate your commitment and what you do. And, and like has been said, you are the face of Tulare County. When people think of Tulare County, they think of that last person they saw wherever they were in whatever department they were. And uh, that's so important. And I've had so many wonderful experiences over the last eight years that I've been a part of this county family. Each time I have the opportunity to work with someone individually or work with a group of people in the county, I've always been so impressed, again, with the level of dedication, with the knowledge. And I agree with Supervisor Worthy, we do have the smartest people in the state, maybe in the nation. <laughs> all right, well, I reiterate the comments of my colleagues and just really want to say thank you to all the county employees that make our job uh, the best job that there is in this county because we. Uh, get to work with you and we get to oftentimes take credit for the work that you do uh, but we know that you are the ones that are out there doing the work and I know these last few years have not been the easiest uh, in Tulare County in any county in the state or any governmental entity um, it's been difficult but you know what you have persevered and you've uh, stayed with us and uh, really maintained that dedication and commitment um, and, and every one of the employees that is here today has been recognized for 15 years at least of county service that means that your mentors uh, to the younger generation and um, I don't know how much I, I look at I'm kidding these guys are all my mentors because they're all older, older than me and they have more experience than me but um, the value of your mentoring uh, of the younger employees is so critical and so valuable to Tulare County um, you know they, they talk about the older generation uh, being the greatest generation and, and retiring and, and moving on um, but there's so much good that you did for this county and making this county work I hope that you're able to share that information, share that knowledge with the younger generation so that we can maintain uh, the great direction that you've set us in. Um, so again, thank you. Things will get better and we appreciate your efforts, we appreciate your perseverance, and most of all, we appreciate your service. And on behalf of uh, Tulare County, uh, we say thank you and 
uh, I, as one supervisor, and I know my colleagues would like to join me, would like to give you a standing ovation before we end this presentation. So thank you very much. All right, and with that, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a brief uh, three, three to five minute recess. i surprise my colleagues what time we call this back while we let our employees get back to work and do the great deeds they do for Tulare County. Thank you, everyone. Scheduled board meeting, that would be fantastic. Um, Mr. Rousseau is locked out, so hopefully he will. Okay. <laughs> nice to see you join us, Gene. Um, all right, the next item on our agenda is item number three, and that's public comments. Uh, this portion of the meeting is reserved for members of the public wishing to comment on any item not appearing on the agenda today. Under state law, public comment can be and will be limited to three minutes. I see a member of the public that I recognize, Ms. Sullivan. What do you have for us this yes, morning? Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, fellow board members. Uh, Crystal Sullivan, Chief of Litigation for the County of Tulare. I have with me today Deputy Chief Julia Langley, one of the smart people with the county. <laughs> who just re who? <laughs> she just recently prevailed at the 5th District Court of Appeal on our mar medical marijuana ordinance issue, and I'd like her to take a very few uh, minutes to um, brief you on the outcome. Great, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, your board may remember that in 2010, we initiated litigation against a uh, ostensible medical marijuana collective located in an agricultural zone. This was based on your zoning regulation that limits or restricts the location of medical marijuana cooperatives to certain areas based on um, threats to public health and safety in terms of where they're located. Uh, we prevailed in that litigation and obtained an injunction against that collective, and they appealed that to the Fifth District Court of Appeals. And as you know, the wheels of justice grind slowly, uh, but they grind exceedingly small. And yesterday, the Fifth District Court of Appeal affirmed the trial court's ruling, and they have upheld your zoning ordinance. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, and. And they've said, again, unequivocally, that neither one of these medical marijuana statutes, the Compassionate Use Act or the Medical Marrow Program Act, neither one of these give qualified patients or caregivers the unfettered right to cultivate or dispense marijuana wherever they choose. And so um, we're good. We're legal. And we're upheld. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great job. All right, uh, is there anyone else wishing to speak under public comment uh, this morning? Okay, seeing no one, I will close the public comment period and we will now move on to Board of Supervisors matters and we're gonna start with a, a supervisor who was not here with us last week. Supervisor Ishida, what do you have to share with us? Well, Mr. Chairman, it's been a busy two weeks. Uh, the, I attended a RCRC meeting in Mariposa County. Uh, it was a board meeting. I sit on the board representing Tulare County. The one thing that came out in that meeting that kind of struck me was that this SRA fee, this fee for fire, uh, for people who live in the, the responsibility district for CAL FIRE, triggered something that unintended consequence, and that is the insurance companies are looking at all those parcels and in your mountain communities more so up north some of the insurance companies are not writing new insurance and they also are upping the insurance fees for those people who live in, in the foothills and the mountains under in the uh, cal fire responsibility area so this i don't believe has hit us yet in clary county but it has uh, impacted many other counties especially the mountain counties. So another good deed <laughs> goes, never goes unpunished. Last uh, Saturday, I attended the Orange Blossom Festival Banquet, which was basically in honor, uh, honoring the sister city program between Ono City, Japan, 
in Lindsay, which is, was celebrating their 40th uh, anniversary. So we had a lot of dignitaries from uh, Ono City at the, uh, at the banquet. Last Tuesday, the reason I missed the board meeting, I attended a California Freight Advisory Committee meeting, which I represent the eight San Joaquin Valley counties. And I have a seat at that table with 50 other people. And it's a very uh, all-inclusive group. We have environmentalists, we have the railroad companies, we have the other council of governments, uh, we have uh, uh, cabinet members, we have trucking, we have everybody. We're, we are looking to develop a statewide freight program, a goods movement program. Is one of the highest costs in, in business right now is the, the delivery of goods. And since California brings in about 60% of all the imports by ship, that it's a very important uh, issue for the state of California. I heard a lot of words about compromise in this program. Well, to me, there's no compromise. That we're there to do a freight program. And when we look at the environmental side of a freight program, that is the logical beneficiaries of a good freight program is how do you move freight efficiently throughout the state of California and your side benefit will be the environmental side of global warming and every other thing that uh, they believe is important. Last Thursday I attended a regional water quality board meeting and uh, recently the state water quality board was was told to stop in implementing groundwater fees uh, monitoring fees on farmers on irrigated farmlands because their EIR was inadequate but our district uh, they're going to full speed ahead looking at doing regulations and fees and the fee they came up with in the media was 19 about $19.50 an acre per year per irrigated farmland in, in, in our district. Tulare County has 1 million acres of irrigated land. So that's $19.5 million a year they want to take out of Tulare County for a nitrate groundwater monitoring program. Quite frankly, if we had $19.5 million a year, probably for five years, and maybe 10, we could, we could take care of the nitrate problem in our disadvantaged communities and our cities. We'd have enough money to solve the problem instead of putting it into a monitoring program where we get a stack of paper and we do not accomplish anything. Uh, then on Friday, I attended the San Joaquin Valley uh, Partnership Economic Summit. Uh, is all positive news and Friday night I attended the graduation of six new lieutenants for our fire department and like I mentioned uh, June will be the sixth anniversary of our Tulare County Fire Department and because of people like Chief Sunderland, Mendoza and others that we hired to put this department together we've ha had more or less a seamless transition from Cal Fire into a county fire department and I'm very proud of the way our county fire department has been functioning and I'm very proud of the men and the new the six new lieutenants we have on hand and that's all I have I'm sorry it went long I've been gone for a while that's okay <laughs> we're, we're used to it supervisor we're gonna move on now to uh, Supervisor Cox uh, a few things last week it was my pleasure to uh, attend an event Wednesday evening put on by our district attorney uh, where a memorial quilt was unveiled for victims of violent crime. Always a very touching um, time to be with uh, families and friends of those families who suffered a, a loss over the last year and also over the last 15 or 20 years people that have been affected by violent crime or lost someone to violent crime 
uh, usually comes uh, to support the others that are there. Uh, still mourning in some way, but a very, uh, very heartfelt good event. I want to thank the district attorney for continuing uh, that program. It's, it's very, uh, very much needed to keep the healing process going for these folks. Um, on Thursday evening, we had the Step Up Challenge Awards uh, program at the Fox Theater. I believe we had winners in every district. Each of the supervisors have been given a, a listing of the schools that participated in uh, their district and who the winners were and what the projects were and we'll have a presentation come back to the board here uh, when our uh, I guess when the agenda lightens up a little bit so in the next month we'll have a report uh, Saturday my wife and I went out uh, to Moody Grove working with the Mormon Helping Hands group there were several hundred members of our church who went out and did service projects in Exeter um, Farmersville Visalia we happened to be able to work over at Mooney Grove, uh, cleaning one of the uh, old buildings out there. And it was very interesting uh, to meet with Stephanie. It was very nice talking with her. And I, I commented how many spiders there were. And she goes, well, Supervisor Cox, you need to look around you. We are in the middle of a park. And this park is full of trees. She goes, we can knock down every spider web today and come back tomorrow and it's back again. So. Uh, the, the work that was done was very much appreciated because we were able to get some of the deep cleaning done uh, that you really don't see on a on a day to day basis. Also, another group planted over a thousand plants in a, uh, a walk park over on County Center and uh, Cameron. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Supervisor Cox. Supervisor Worthley. Uh, actually, not go ahead. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I had my order in my mind that I was going <laughs> okay. Which would have put me, you know, three, four usually follows three, so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of things. Last week, I was asked to come before the Dynamo City Council. Uh, they were concerned about our uh, CNG uh, program and uh, concerned about jeopardizing the uh, diversion that we're now achieving uh, with the new RFP that's gone out, and they wanted to me to have that share of that with the board. Um, they're, they're concerned about diversions. I mean, they're a member of our CWMA, and the reason for being that is so they get the benefit of working together to get the diversion rates up, and there's a concern that, that we may be going the wrong direction. So I just wanted to share that with the board. Uh, this uh, coming Thursday and Friday, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Air, Air Board is going to be having a, a retreat up at the Bass Lake, so I will be at, attending that event. And uh, last Friday, Dineba High School had hosted an invitational um, track meet where over 30 school, or, or rather 30 schools participated from up and down the valley. And so my wife and I uh, worked at uh, trying to get all those kids signed up for the different events. And it's quite, a, quite an event, but uh, it's, it's quite amazing to see all those kids come from all over the place. And I tell you, very impressed with the quality of kids that came through, very appreciative about being there, very polite, and, and uh, we had a really good experience. So that's, that's all I have. That's great. And you even got to meet another Vanderpool. Um, go ahead, Supervisor Ennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> talk about the, uh, the youth challenge uh, through the Step Up program. I had three schools in Porterville that were involved in that. Uh, Burton Middle School, Bartlett, and Menachee. And Burton Middle School uh, won a $2,500 award, which uh, it was quite a vast <coughs> They did so many things. They recycled, they cleaned the campus, they had their own garden, they painted graffiti. I mean, th this thing was so diversified, but they had the kids that they took videos and, and uh, really, these kids really had a lot of enthusiasm. I was, I got to visit them uh, over there and it was really something to see. Uh, Menachee High School, I was the runner up. Uh, Mr. Lujan, who was, was on the uh, uh, Burton Middle School, I wanted to to make sure I got his name uh, out there because he did an excellent, excellent job with them. And Menachee High School was a runner-up and uh, uh, Cindy Savage was the advisor there and theirs was on uh, bullying and prevention and uh, building self-esteem. And then the Barton Middle School also was, uh, got an innovation award for their bullying and uh, bullying awareness and stuff. So I think we're we're finally getting, I think the kids are starting to get on board with this bullying and, and seeing what, what, ha what can happen. Uh, also, uh, Thursday, we're going to have our big gang summit in Porterville, uh, Porterville High School at 430. 
Uh, Dr. Ramon Reza will be our keynote speaker, and we'll have all kinds of breakout sessions, and uh, looking forward to that. We're hoping for a big crowd. We've had as, as high as seven or 800 kids. Uh, the last one we were at uh, Granite Hills, we only had about five or 600 people show up, but we're hoping for well over 1,000, because this high school is centrally located right in the middle of town. So looking forward to that. So that's all I have. All right, thank you, Supervisor. I just want to go over a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, this Friday in Tulare, uh, they're going to be having a grand opening for their newest park over at Mulcahy Middle School. Uh, that's going to be a community park that will serve uh, uh, the community of Tulare. Tulare has some wonderful parks that uh, uh, community members really enjoy right now, so it's great to see them open up other opportunities and diversify the locations uh, of those parks. Um, so that's going to be really exciting, and that's in collaboration with the Tulare City School District as well as the Parks and Recreation Department in Tulare. So uh, we know that parks are very key to physical well-being and wellness, and uh, I look forward to that opening in Tulare. Um, also wanted to make a plug. I know today is April 30th, but tomorrow is May 1st, um, and wanted to make a plug for our Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, which begins tomorrow. Um, I do serve uh, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors on the Tulare County Mental Health Board uh, and really enjoy that opportunity. And, I just want to make a plug for uh, what they are doing and the activities that they are undertaking this month to really spread awareness and uh, bring help to a segment of the population that's often overlooked. You know, when you think of a one in five children or one in four adults suffering from a diagnosable mental health illness at some point in their life, um, you realize that it touches every one of us uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I really encourage everyone to, to learn about uh, mental health issues this month and to really help spread the awareness about uh, all of the issues and complications surrounding mental health uh, issues in uh, our community. So uh, with that, uh, it looks like Supervisor Sheet is really not done. He would like another comment. Go ahead, Supervisor. I forgot something. Okay. You know, when you're a kid, you look, I think I might have said this before, you look forward to certain things. You look forward to being 16 years old so you get a driver's license. You look forward to being 21 so you can, well, it's now it's 18 that you can vote and you can legally consume alcohol. 21. At 21. <laughs> uh, and then there's a big void. What, what do you look for? What are the other threshold marks in your life that, happen after 21. Well, I hit my one of them last week, and I joined uh, Supervisor Ennis on Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't see any other uh, uh, landmarks. We have mileposts in the future, <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that uh, I'm partnering with uh, Supervisor Ennis now. I think every birthday you look forward to. <laughs> well, you did forget one milestone that happens after 21, which I experienced a few years ago, and that was being able to rent a car, so that was kind of neat. Uh, that, that, was, that was really something to achieve. Uh, but anyways, um, so that being concluded now, we're going to move on to our 930 timed items, and before we get to those, we're going to entertain the consent calendar. Um, there are no items that are requested by uh, staff to be pulled from the agenda uh, this week. Are there any items from uh, members of the board or members of the public at this time? Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. We pull okay. item, hey, hang, hang pull on. item 23 for separate consideration. We, we will move. Uh, we will pull item 23. We have a motion from Supervisor Worthley to Absolute. approve the balance of the consent Correct. and a second by Supervisor Ennis. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And we will now undertake item 23. Mr. Chair, I have a quick question of our fire folks on this. Uh, so yesterday I had asked and hadn't got the answer. Maybe uh, Mr. Russo has the answer to this. My question was, are we purchasing this radio equipment for the state of California, or is this switching just so that they can dispatch for us? Uh, do they not have the wideband capability themselves on, at their station or in their trucks? And if they already have that, why are we buying more equipment? Pretty simple, I think. You know, I do have the answer, but we'll let uh, Mr. Mendoza give his final presentation. <laughs> 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 Couldn't let you leave without putting your feet to the fire a little bit. Yeah. Sir, my only argument is I'm retiring. Do you have to, really, do you have to question me? <laughs> no, I, I can answer your question. Uh, <clears throat> 
In 2007, when we moved out of the CDF, I know I'm a CDF, that's who I worked for, and I know there are no Cal Fire now, but forgive me, CDF. Um, we left our old radio over there so that we could communicate with them, and they also function as a backup. All of our radio tones for the station, so what the dispatchers do is they, they stack up the pagers, say we're going to send Dinuba, uh, Kings River, or Rossi, so they stack them up, they hit a key and they send it, and it transmits through that radio. What happened was is that the old radio that we left with the CDF folks is old and it cannot be narrow-banded. So it's an illegal radio. Recently, the state radio technicians went in there talking to the CDF personnel. They said, please, no, don't take that radio out. So right now, all they can use it is as a receiver. They can't transmit on it. So heaven forbid, if something were to go down at our shop, our radio were to fail or something bad happens, they can take over dispatching, even though it may be a little bit ugly, but they would be able to dispatch from the CDF facility, keep our engines going, get somebody to your home, wherever. And so that's the purpose for it. So what we want to do is our current radio is seven years old. It's, we bought it when we took over. So we would like to take our old radio out, this brand new one that we're requesting, putting it at, at Firecom as a daily driver, take our used one, and then put it over there so they can transmit with it. So if we would, they, they become really a backup and it's essential to the system. That's this is part of that cooperation. They're also able to talk dispatch to, uh, center to dispatch center. Okay. Great. Any Thank other you. questions? That was a fantastic final presentation, Chief. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you again. We appreciate it. Let's do a motion to approve. We have a motion by Supervisor Cox, second. a second by Supervisor Ennis. Please vote. And you got a unanimous vote on your final presentation. So great <laughs> job, Chief. <laughs> Enjoy retirement. Um, all right. Uh, now we are done with the consent calendar, and we will undertake our timed items, uh, beginning with item number five. Uh, which is a public hearing, a request from the Treasurer Tax Collector Registrar of Voters to approve the proposed fee schedule to recover incurred costs. Rita? Good morning, Chairman Vanderpool, Supervisors, Mr. Rousseau, Ms. Roberts. We're here today to conduct a public hearing to change certain fees charged in the Tulare County Treasurer Tax Collector and Registrar Voters offices. And after the hearing, ask that the board then approve these changes to the fee schedule for these offices. I don't really have a PowerPoint. I just put in the agenda item that's in your packet. And I thought it'd be appropriate to have the fees up on the screen, but it's kind of hard to see them, huh? <laughs> it's a small <laughs> spreadsheet. <laughs> um, the, the treasure tax collector and registrar of voters perform certain functions for which fees may be charged to recover incurred costs. The board has asked us to annually review the fees that are charged. On the schedule attached to the agenda item are fees we felt warranted to changes. All calculations have been reviewed by the auditor's office and county council as required by county procedures. These phase fees are based on time studies and current materials costs. They've also been noticed in the Visaya Times Delta newspaper as required. If approved, the change amounts will become effective in 60 days. The approval of these fees will have little effect on the overall revenue of the office due to the low occurrence of the charges and the small amount of the increases or decreases. The first item on the treasurer tax collector schedule, which is a new fee, uh, allowed under Revenue Taxation Code 2922 for the cost of judgment and satisfaction of judgment letters prepared in some unsecured property tax collections. All of the items in the other items in the Treasurer Tax Collector's uh, schedule are being reduced. Uh, the last three items under the tax sale section, if I can get this down here, right in here, these three here, are to bring fees to a flat amount instead of actual costs to make it easier for the public and for the cashiers collecting the fees. The last item, oh, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the election one. Instead of, instead of the treasure tax collector one. On my list it was first, sorry. Yes, the first one is up here, and then these three here. The last one is uh, under seizure, is to change from a flat amount to $15 plus cost to match the change wording now in Revenue Taxation Code 2958. 
There can be widely varied costs when seizing unsecured property for unpaid taxes, such as if a sheriff deputy is required for the action, or if a locksmith is required, or if towing is required, or specific expertise is required, such as someone who can drive a combine or a bulldozer. It's been 40 years or so since I've driven one of those, so we'd have to hire somebody. <laughs> so on the registrar voter side, I can get that one back up. There we go. All of the fee changes requested are increased slightly. If it's based on time studies and current materials costs, but also the cost of the programs used to maintain the files and prepare certain reports have increased. So that's the major reason why those costs have increased there. But they're just slightly up, most of them. The last item on that schedule, the fee for district maps, is to make it clear to customers that we charge the same price as the county GIS division for any maps created. There was confusion on that, and we'd like to have that in our schedule just for the public. So thank you, and I'm available to answer any questions. Any questions or comments? Mr. Con Mr. Chairman, I, 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 again, I appreciate the fact why we don't have a CPI built into our, our fee structure, because as, we, as you pointed out, Rita, many of our fees are dropping. Mm -hmm. That comes about because of greater efficiencies or greater purchasing power, whatever the case may be, uh, better employees, smarter employees. But the fact of the matter is that uh, when we do this kind of, uh, it's, it's almost like zero-based budgeting, where we go back and examine, we find out that sometimes what we are charging people exceeds our actual cost, and that's the whole purpose of fees, is to recover our costs. So, Appreciate you bringing this forward, and uh, I'm sure one of the reasons we probably won't have a lot of people showing up here to uh, be upset about that is because we have both a combination of some small increases and some decreases, and that that's a, speaks well for your operations. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're very proud of the efficiencies we've brought forward in the tax collector side, especially. Any other comments? Um, I, I just have one one comment that I would make. You know, I'm glad to see a lot of these fees going down. Um, but I did have one comment, and that was, you know, you can kind of tell b based on resolution numbers when they were uh, passed. So, like, I'm looking at a fee um, that was from 2003 um, where we recovered 128% of our costs. And I realized that efficiencies have been gained since that time, um, but just making the point to constantly be reviewing these fees and, and bringing decreases as soon as we possibly can because uh, I really make want to make sure that we're never charging more than... Uh, the actual cost of uh, providing that service. So, um, but I really am, uh, in general, very happy with the uh, decreases that you're bringing forward. So, thank you. Thank you, Rita. Any other comments? You, Supervisor Shida has. I also like to thank you for bringing these uh, adjustments forward, and I hope all the other departments do the same. Because I hate to see us get involved again with a fee that hadn't been raised in 10 years, and all of a sudden we get this massive increase, and so. For all the other department heads and electeds, please keep us updated with the fees, with the increases and the decreases, as the chairman stated. Thank you. Supervisor Cox? I'll, I'll echo that. Supervisor Vanderpool's happy for the decreases. I'm happy for the increases because it reduces our net county cost. I'll just echo what Supervisor Sheeta said. We need to stay on top of this and not let uh, these things slide for five, ten years. If you have a fee that was 200 percent of what you were you know, it was costing you, you go for 10 years, that could trigger issues where you need to go back and do some refunds. We don't want to be in that situation either. So thank you, Rita. I know you guys run a tight shop to the penny. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, this is a public hearing. I will now open the public hearing uh, and ask if there's any members of the public that would like to wish or would wish to comment on this item. Seeing no comments, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. There's a motion second. by Supervisor Ishida, a second by Supervisor Cox. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Rita. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, next item on our agenda is item number six a, is a public hearing, a request from Health and Human Services Agency to adopt fee adjustments for Public Guardian, Environmental Health, Public Health, Health Operations, and Medical Records Divisions for fiscal year 2013-2014, beginning July 1, 2013. Tim. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, Tim Lutz with Health and Human Services. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to come before you this morning to discuss our requested fee increases for the Health and Human Services Agency. 
um, similar to the auditor's office, we went through our fees this year and looked at areas where we wanted to bring fees in line, bring them down where we could, um, and some going up with the idea of recuperating our costs and trying to make it as fair and equitable to the members of the community at the same time. We identified five programs that needed um, fee changes this year, our public guardian environmental health, our public health immunizations program, our health operations, which are our clinics, and also our medical records division. The first um, item is the public guardian. With that, we have one fee, and that's for our representative payee program. That fee is what we charge for the management of client assets that are um, receiving social security, supplemental security benefits. And so what we end up doing with that is managing their finances, paying their rent, um, clothing, things like that. The idea there is it's a safety net for those clients to make sure their bills are paid, they remain safely in whatever, um, if they're in a home or if they're in a facility. Those costs, um, we're in asking for an increase of 2.6% or $1 and they will cover um, costs of managing those finances for those clients. The next area is our environmental health program. I'll spend the most time on this just because this is where um, we started to look at some of the most changes. I anticipate next year bringing even more to the board. Um, this was kind of our first round. We had to make some changes this year, and so as long as we were going to do that, we'd try and do some restructuring. Over the last year and a half, two years, there have been a lot of changes in the environmental health program, including new leadership. And with that, um, there's been a greater emphasis in looking at compliance and enforcing state laws, mandates. And the key area in that program is the fees we charge for various services. The fees are a um, complete cost recovery for that program. Um, without those fees, you know, we would have county general fund costs. So the key there is striking that balance between what recuperates cost, but also is fair and equitable to members of the community. And we've been very sensitive to that throughout the this process over the last year, the environmental health um, division manager has gone out and talked to a number of chambers with the, those types of concerns on the community impacts. And as we progress through this, depending on your board's action today, um, if we were to have an approved fee, we would still engage the chamber with outreach on the changes, but also looking at that, um, the new structure, if there needs to be adjustments, bring that back to the board and make those adjustments. But our goal going into this was to keep fees as low as possible for as many of the um, vendors who are applying for permits as possible. So what we did then is create a greater categorization of our fees with the idea that um, it creates a more transparent um, relationship when the person comes in. So whereas you might have had one swap meet vendor fee, now you can break it down to having two or three. Um, same with our farmers markets and also our um, temporary food facility. And I'll get into those in a, in a second, but just knowing that what we tried to do is create more tiers. So it looks like we're adding additional fees, but in fact what we're trying to do is create more transparency so someone knows what they're coming in and asking for. Our new methodology that we're doing is based on a um, time and risk standard with the idea that a lower risk um, food vendor requires less time for us to go out, do an inspection, so they're charged less. This is in contrast to our previous approach, which was pretty much the one size fits all, try and target it to what your average or maybe more expensive vendor takes, and so then the simpler ones end up sharing a much greater cost than the, than the less complex ones. So what we then looked at is the savings that would result to these lower risk category food vendors. And I wanted to give you two examples on here. Um, with the not potentially hazardous food vendors, under the current fee structure, they're paying $116. 
under the new fee structure, they would be paying $58. So there would be a 50% reduction in the fees that that group is paying. Tim, for Tim, can I stop you real quick and just ask you there? Um, so the not potentially hazardous food vendor, for example, an issue that's coming up uh, with me very frequently is uh, uh, the Tulare Kiwanis Club does a pancake breakfast that uh, they try to put on for various different uh, community functions. They do it at, at no charge, and, and they've actually come forward and said they're probably going to have to stop uh, with the pancake breakfast if they're going to be charged these fees and have the uh, inspection costs and uh, everything else just uh, add up. Um, is there any thought of a nonprofit type carve out or uh, even further reduced fee for um, nonprofit type functions or or not? I, I understand there's the that the hazard risk uh, has to be balanced with the time it takes to inspect, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's difficult when you have someone trying to do the good uh, for another organization and have to be held responsible for uh, that level of fee. And that certainly is, um, and we recognize a challenge for um, nonprofits that, like you say, if they're not charging for the food, they have limited ability to recoup. Um, when we look at that, the, the issue is our mandates, of course, never change for what we have to inspect. And there's still always going to be the cost associated with bringing the, the person out, doing that inspection. and. If we exempted, for instance, those groups, we'd run into a situation where we wouldn't have enough revenue coming in to cover those costs. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may jump in. Sure. Uh, Julia Roberts, Chief Deputy County Counsel. Um, gov uh, the, your Tulare County Ordinance Code sections 160 and 165 allows the board to uh, refund or reduce or even waive fees right. on case-by-case -case basis. So if this is something that um, your board, if one of these programs is something your board feels strongly about, you maybe could use your good works money okay. and, and or reduce the fees uh, okay. for them on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sorry to interrupt you, Tim. Oh, that's okay. Did you uh, have any other questions? Oh, that was I? sufficient. Thank you. Okay. The next example is on our potentially hazardous food vendors um, under the current structure um, for a temporary facility, um, they would be paying $326 under the old structure. Under the new one, they would be paying $174, which would be a 47% reduction. Chair, I sure. also had supervisor. What is a potentially hazardous? <laughs> I know. I, stay away. I got quite an education in um, environmental health from uh, Vivian, our environmental health manager. Um, Really what we look at on the scales is, you know, your, your least hazardous is something like an apple. There's very few risks if you're, you know, giving an apple. You start to get into gray area if you have like melons or if you have um, cheese, eggs, um, any raw meats that then comes to a tier where it's now potentially hazardous food. You add more complexity sometimes if you're then value adding by preparing that food in some way. So the idea is take the tier of if somebody's just literally giving you an apple, that's the least hazardous. If they're cutting up that apple, serving it, that adds a little more risk because now you're having somebody have to actually cut it, prepare it, and you worry about hygiene, where it's cut, things like that. I was told that that became a prepackaged item once you cut it up and put it in a bag and didn't have to have the inspection. The prepackaged, and part of that might also be um, where it's prepared. If, well, now, you know, I, I pause for I, asking. Oh no, that's all right. I'm it's a good question. We've been having, you know, since we've got new people in place, we've got, you know, I think being a little more vigilant, which we should, because our concern is the public safety, public health. Um, we just. Our phone is kind of ringing off the hook from folks that were used to doing the pancake breakfast as a fundraiser or something of that nature, and now they're, they're finding out they're going to have to do something they've not had to do for the last 30 years. Good morning, Board. Vivian Nelson, Environmental Health, HHSA. Ms. Roberts, Mr. Rousseau, Mr. Chair. Uh, the question was prepackaged, and prepackaged would mean packaged pre which would indicate that it was packaged at the place of manufacture. Putting it into a baggie would not be considered prepackaged. 
with some exceptions, and as you get into the food code, the more questions you ask, the more questions are generated. So I can get deeper and deeper and give you all of the exemptions, but just suffice it to say that generally a baggie would not be considered prepackaged. Thanks. Did, was there another question? Well, I'm, just, I, I'm gonna take, the, I, if you're cooking anything, you're a hazardous food. Potentially. <laughs> Potentially, yes. Okay. So looking at the fee um, requests, what we're looking at or requesting from the board is to delete um, the two broad categories, which is the produce prepackaged food um, at the 116 and then the temporary food event annual single vendor and really then create clarity on what exactly those are because reading them, they're not entirely clear. And so what we did then is take um, three different sets. This first one is the temporary food facility vendor. And there you can see the first tier is the not potentially hazardous food at the $58. Then if you have the value added with the food sampling, some kind of preparation, it goes to 116. And then the potentially hazardous foods um, goes up to $174. The next group, which is what we are adding this year, um, is the certified farmer's market vendors. And those we broke out with four tiers um, with the same relationship or structure as the, um, the previous, which is the not potentially hazardous food, um, the food sampling value added. And then because this is where we start to um, get also more of the potentially hazardous foods, we have the 174. And then really just for clarity and breakout purposes for our track, and you can see there are, there's a separate potentially hazardous food, food sampling that's the same fee, but again, um, separate because there's something that's being done to that food beyond just um, preparing it to leave. And then the last is the swap meat vendors, two tiers there um, because there isn't, for the any of the swap meat vendors, there isn't, um, potentially hazardous food, it's just, you know, handing it out or dispensing samples of it. And so that's um, the 58 or $116. Tim, are all those fees annual fees? Yes. Okay, so one vendor annual yes. basis. Okay. Now, there, um, there one caveat that I will say going to the temporary food facility vendor is that is per location. And so whereas the old fee structure, a lot of people, if they go to one or two locations, they're paying $326, but they were able to go all around the county. Um, when we looked at statute, um, that wasn't allowed. We needed to then make that modification. And that's part of that impetus by bringing these fees down in this category especially, is that they could be paying the $116 twice because they're at different facilities. The idea is they pick up their kitchen changes at each of those locations, so it has to be reinspected. It's not as simple as a mobile food vendor where they have their own kitchen in their um, vehicle. It travels around with them, and you know it's more or less consistent wherever they're at. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, that raises a question, I guess, Tim. Because uh, as I think about those examples of people who go from place to place, some of them are in you know their, their their systems are ones that don't change so in other words they have a a mobile unit of some kind so they're they're using the same you see them haul them down the freeways right they go to the various carnivals and so forth in that situation they're going to different facilities but they're using their same if they have plumbing, a truck yeah if they have a truck then that would be a mobile food facility. And so therefore they pay it, they don't have, they're not being, even though they're going for, to a temporary place, it's not gonna be, they're not gonna be hit with a fee every time they go to a different Correct. carnival site or something like that. This is more encompassing somebody that maybe comes out and barbecues at Mooney Grove, they're you know, using the barbecue pit there, or then they're going to um, the Ag Expo and then doing something different. They don't have an actual kitchen that comes with them, so to speak. The other area that we did um, change is our swap meet, or I'm sorry, our organizer fees. And with that, we had the one organizer fee at 341. 
we would um, request to delete that and add the certified farmer's market organizer fee, temporary food facility organizer fee, and swap meet organizer fee. Um, again, just for clarity purposes so they know exactly what they're applying for. This is the only real increase that we're requesting, which is $7 um, and 2%. That reflects um, in, the, in the prior years um, that hadn't been updated um, for two years when we changed our base billing rate, that $116. This was just catching that up with the base billing rate. And then we would also have an organizer plan resubmittal fee um, of $58, and that's if there are, they submit the plan, it's done, but then they come back and want to make changes to it and resubmit that fee. And then the workers have to go back out, reinspect it, make sure that it still um, meets code. If there are any other questions on the um, environmental health vendor fees, I can go to the next. The next one is the public health immunization fees. And there we're requesting eight increases with the average amount of the increase at $9.63. We're requesting four decreases. Average amount of the decrease is $11.50. And we are providing one um, new vaccine. These fees are typically billed out to the, um, the health care plans if people um, come to the you know, immunization clinics and their health plan um, offers that coverage. It could also be billed as a um, direct cost to the client if there isn't insurance in place or billed to like the um, Larry County Medical Services Program. I should add on top of um, these fees, they're included in here is a $9 administrative fee that was approved last year at the board and that is not changing this year. So all of these increases reflect the direct change in the price of the vaccine themselves. And so um, that's where you see the variability, why some go up, some go down. It really just based on the costs of our medications. And if there are any other questions on the immunizations piece, I can go to the next section. Our health clinic fees, we're requesting um, three adjustments of the fees there. The way that our federally qualified health centers work um, is that our rates are based off of the Medi-Cal procedure codes, or I'm sorry, medical procedure codes. And the industry standard is to first try and base that rate off of 150% of Medicare. If that's not available, we base it off of the Medi-Cal rate, and that's um, what is required for the FQHC itself. When we looked at the three that um, needed to be adjusted, they don't have um, Medicare procedure codes, so we use the Medi-Cal rate. So costs of this are based um, on the Medi-Cal rate. And these are the three fees. All three are increases. Um, again, with the cost of um, the medical procedure, that includes whatever the um, medication or apparatus is, and then the doctor time, um, the staff overhead, things like that. And this is then billed to insurance companies or um, Medi-Cal or to um, patients on a sliding fee scale, and that sliding fee scale is based on income and ability to pay. The last fee we have is our medical record retrieval fees. This year, similar to environmental health, we came in and eva evaluated that structure and the practice of how we charge for um, retrieving and duplicating fees. We left most of those fees unchanged. What we are requesting is a reduction in one of those and also to add a, another one to um, I think more accurately recuperate costs, and I'll get into that on the next slide. We're also um, looking at adding a fee for costs of medical record reports. What this is is when um, claims administrators or attorneys ask our physicians to do a, a more comprehensive medical report on a client. It then um, 
the doctor needs to go in, pull the chart, go through the information, compile this report, and send it up. The average time for completing that is about 30 minutes. And because it is either a, um, a doctor or a um, nurse practitioner, it's usually a, you know, it's pulling a more expensive position out of doing their um, time to see clients. And so we wanted to try and establish a fee to recuperate some of those costs. So what we can see on the medical records retrieval, processing, and copying, um, we'd like to add a retrieval and processing fee, which is $4 per quarter hour. In general, um, the time it takes to, for that retrieval is between two minutes to 30 minutes, typically probably about 15 minutes. So what we did also to try and keep costs at a minimum if there's something complex is cap that at two hours. So the max would be um, $16 at that point. Then um, the, um, I'm sorry, 28, 32, <laughs> says the math person. Um, and then also the requests for microfilm pages, the, um, when we looked at the newest regulations, the max um, cost was $20 per page. We very infrequently have those, but um, we did keep the fee on the book in case we do have to go back to some old microfilm because um, there are still some sitting around in existence for us. We just rarely have to go back to it. And then the last piece is the medical evaluation form and report. On that, um, we're requesting 49.44. That's the odd number is because it was based strictly on the cost, that the time study cost of performing that function with the office staff, medical assistant, and then the physician or nurse practitioner to actually complete the report and submit it. And that concludes um, the fee presentation. I would be happy to answer questions. Any questions from board members, Supervisor Worthley? It's just simply as that last one, I think we should either round it up or round it down and make it an even number because so 44 is. cents is just creates havoc in terms of trying to keep track of everything. So other than that, I have no other comments. Okay, any other comments or questions from the board members? I should do it later. All right, we, this is a, uh, Mr. Chairman, ahead. I did want to correct myself. I quoted, um, Ordinance Code Sections 160 and 165 is being your fee uh, waivers or refunds, and it's actually 130 and 135. I don't know where my mind is. You know, I knew that oh. off the top of my you head. Knew that, didn't I you? knew that. So, so I I'm glad you corrected it because I was, was going to correct no later. you if you didn't. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with that, this is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing at this time. Is there any member of the public that would wish to comment? Uh, please state your name and address for the record. You can use either microphone. Good morning. And they are adjustable, so you can adjust them. Good morning. My name is Alan Landon. Um, I'm a retired teacher from the county here. My wife's also a retired teacher. She knows Pete. Oh. Uh, Kathy Landon at Tulare. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, since we've retired, we've formed a small business, and we have uh, a wood-fired brick oven on a trailer, which we take to farmer's markets, and we cook amazing pizzas, apparently, because we get a lot of nice compliments. Um, now, I've been doing this for two years. This, we're beginning our third season this now. And uh, last December, we were, in the past, um, I was able to pay the $326 one time, and it covered all my activities during an entire year. One, one charge of $326, and that covered, we did the, the Thursday evening to the uh, Visalia Farmer's Market weekly during the summer. We also added the Tuesday evening Farmer's Market in Tulare last summer for the first time. And we were also able to attend uh, weekend activities. Uh, we went to the uh, Porterville Fire Department uh, chili cook-off. Uh, we've done things in Exeter and so on, 4th of July, uh, harvest festivals and things. And that one $326 covered my entire year. Uh, about December, I think it was, we received a letter from the uh, TCEH uh, saying that uh, the county council had reviewed the, the, uh, the CRFC, California Retail Food Code, and said that um, there's a word in there, the location, which is what uh, Mr. Wordley brought up. The word location has been interpreted differently than it has been in the, in the past. And that now, to participate in what I've been doing, I must pay a $326 fee per Visalia market. 
I must pay a $326 fee for Tulare Market, and I must pay $53, I think it is, for each weekend event we want to participate in. Now, this is not a 2% increase or 50% decrease in our fees. It's a huge, you know, a couple hundred percent increase in the fees we're required to pay. Now, I'm not the only one that's affected by this. Uh, Tulare, uh, the Visalia Farmers Market has about 10 vendors who do what I do. And they also participate in other uh, farmers markets and uh, weekly events. And um, if you look at fee generation there, 10 of us in Visalia, $326 a piece, that's $3,260 those 10 people are generating for the Visalia market. Add Tulare to it, there are about 10 more there too. Another $3,260 they're generating. Uh, if we go to Lindsay Market, which I'm not sure how many, we don't participate in that one. It's a weekly event. It's year-round. It, Ten of those, there's 3,260. I don't know how many uh, folks participate in the, in the Lindsay Market. But each of these locations is now requiring huge fee increases. Now, the, the fee, and this is what they sent us in, in December. Now, I was visibly concerned about the, the fee increases we were facing, just me, my wife, for our little business. And uh, I did some research online, and I brought it to the attention of the supervisors uh, through uh, Ms. Martinez. And uh, in it, I had researched nine different counties, and I only looked at counties where I knew, personally knew, that someone was doing exactly the same thing I'm doing, wood fired brick oven going to farmer's markets. And I, that was Sonoma County, Sacramento County, Alameda County, San Luis Obispo County, Kern County, Fresno County. I'm not sure about Kern County, if anybody's doing it there. Uh, Fresno County, Long Beach City, and Orange County. And uh, I, I gave that to Ms. Martinez, and, and I've seen it. I don't know if you ever have seen it, but the, the fees charged in those counties for exactly what I'm doing, because it's a California retail food code. It's the, the state makes the regs, and this allowed, the counties are all in, allowed to interpret the way they they want to implement them, and, and they'll disagree with that word, but uh, the fee structures are very different. But right, um, the proposed fee before the $174, the proposed fee put Tulare County clear at the top of all nine of those jurisdictions in terms of the amount it's going to cost a person doing what I do. They were clear at the top, $326 for the first for, for Tulare County, three hundred twenty-six dollars for the first one, another three twenty-six, and another three twenty-six, and so on. And if I was going to five or six farmers markets, which I can't in this county, but if I was going to five or six of those types of events, it would be a five hundred percent increase in my fees. Uh, and we're small; we we employ a couple. We we've started with high school students, students we worked with in schools, uh, college students have worked for us. We have uh, other folks that work for us now. Uh, but we're employing a few people on a, on a pretty much a regular basis during the summers, and uh, it's really quite a, a backbreaker for us. The, the real key there with the county council apparently was cited by uh, Ms. Nelson that um, in reinterpreting the CRFC was uh, the, the wording of the, it says, a permit shall be valid only for a person, comma, location, comma, type of food sales, or distribution activity. So she interprets that, that as a permit required for every location we go. Um, and you were, you were asking about that and saying, well, what if they're the same everywhere they go? Uh, we are the same. I, we are, we have purchase the right equipment to meet the food code, and the inspectors who come inspect us, they, they say, you've got everything you need. We do it right. And it doesn't matter where we go. We're exactly the same food operation no matter what location we're at. 
And, and Mr. Landon, I've, I've given you a little bit of extra time, but I will tell you, your pizza is quite good, and I didn't get sick, so you've got that to your uh, uh, credibility as well. So um, I, I do see uh, Miss Nelson has stepped forward. If she would like to comment, or if Tim would like to uh, comment in response to that, um, or would you like me to finish the public comment period and then? We'll, um, well I mean, I, initially, I would one question if I could ask sure, a clarification sure. point too. Please do. Um, on the analysis, it was based on the 326, putting us at the top. Um, right. If we looked at the 174, part of, we identified the issue on the increased cost to vendors, and that was one of the reasons why we restructured it and brought the costs down. Uh -huh. um, my question would be, would the 174 make a difference in terms of what your, um, what your cost structure looks like then at that point? And, and Yes, it would. It, it makes a huge difference. Um, and, and it's kind of odd, too. Uh, when we went from, I was paying 326 to cover the entire year. And we would get, like, and I asked them, you know, how often would I get inspected with my 326? And at the, at the farmer's markets, we got inspected one time during the summer. One time in Tulare, one time in Visalia, one, one inspection. And I said, okay, well, and so the letter comes and said, it's going to be 326 here and 326 there, so I'm paying twice as much as I used to pay. Plus, I'd have to pay more for the weekend things. But what am I getting from my 326? Oh, we're going to inspect you twice during the summer. Okay, twice in Visalia, twice in, Vice in Tulare. Okay, so, and so I brought the information to, the, to Ms. Uh, Martinez, and I uh, hope made it to you. Apparently, something happened. Um, and now they lowered the structure, lowered it down to 174. So I'm going to pay 174, 174 plus all the weekend things, which is bearable. But I said, what's going to happen with the 174? And they said, well, now we're going to inspect you three times at each of the settings. Okay. So it, arbitrary and capricious are the kind of words that came to mind. You were going to go to 326 all over the place and, and inspect me two times. And now you chop it clear down to 174, and you're going to inspect me three times. Mr. Worthley, I have a question. I, I, my, well, my question, I, I, just, I, I tried to ask it last time. I don't think I was very clear about it. But it seems like he would qualify as a mobile food vendor. I know. The, the, okay, well, then then I, I, I have a problem with what we're doing, too, and I understand. I think we need to evaluate what's happening elsewhere because, in my mind, if somebody is a mobile food vendor because they're doing the same thing wherever they go and they're inspected and, they're, and they and maybe there's some criteria I don't understand what, what yeah, qualifies as a mobile food vendor. Maybe we look at need to expanding that somehow because I, it doesn't make sense to me. If somebody, you, you, the, the argument you gave was the reason for doing this is if somebody shows up at a new, fin, new, a new place and now they pull out their barbecue and now they pull all, all this stuff out. If a person's got a self-contained unit and they go from place to place to place and every th time is the, change, is, is the same, what is the difference between that and a mobile food vendor, in which case it seems like one fee for the year takes care of it? I'm, I'm trying to just understand the distinction between those two. That, that's the CRFC. It's, it has well, specific yeah. category for a mobile food facility is self-contained, completely self-contained. All operations take, and you don't have that take place kind of inside. Facility. No. My trailer sitting up. I have a canopy, which I'm required to have. I have my sink inside, my canopy, my refrigeration unit, all my cutting surfaces and everything are inside. And it does not matter where I am, I have exactly all of that equipment. It's all set up the same. Okay, that Great. sounds like a mobile food. So, so, what is your response to that to that question or that inquiry? Do you have any? A temporary food facility is one which would be considered a booth. So, it would have a temporary wall, a temporary ceiling. All of the necessary requirements to prepare safe food are within that booth. The um, heat-fired barbecue would be exterior to the booth. And the food would be prepared on that. It would be cooked, and then it would be brought into the booth to prepare it for service for dispensing. A mobile food facility is self-contained. An example would be a catering truck or a produce truck. A kitchen inside of a catering truck is, is fully enclosed. If it is on the right-hand side, it's the same as if it was on the left-hand side. Nothing will change. However, if you are in a booth or if you have a piece of equipment that is sitting outside, that is subject to all of the location-specific criteria, such as wind, birds, rodents, dust, air, rain, leaves, um, 
people walking by. So the criteria there are different and need to be inspected for each of the different locations, and that's why an inspection is required. A permit is required for a food facility to sell or give away food. And it is specific to the person, to the type of food that they sell, and also to the location that they are selling at for those criteria that I just mentioned. Because it requires the inspector to go in and evaluate the site. So if you're doing something in a temporary food facility at a rodeo, the conditions there are substantially different from doing it on a paved schoolyard. And so although the equipment is set up pretty much the same, um, it's also taken down and stored in a garage or stored somewhere else, then brought out and erected again, but in a different location that have different potential impacts on that safety of food. Okay, Jean, Jean had a comment. Yeah, um, are you finished? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, you know, it, it's clear that we, we probably should, should do some more uh, research into this and look at what other counties are doing. Um, specific to this to this gentleman's case and, and quite frankly the entire environmental health section so why don't we just if, if the board's okay with the other areas of fees go forward approve those and we'll and then HHSA will bring back in the next week or two uh, the environmental fees issue back after they've done some research with other counties and uh, we'll go from there you know, I, and I, I would be very, very much fine with that, and I know I will have to look across to see what other board members' reactions is. Um, but I, I will just make the statement that I don't, you know, whether it's talking about environmental health or resource management agency or fire department, anything, I do not want Tulare County to be at the top of the fee structure for any peer group counties, any valley counties, or any California counties. I do not want to be at the top of the fee structure. I just want to make that point known. That's one supervisor. Um, thank you for your research, Mr. Landon. Um, and if uh, I have to ask, look to the board for a direction in, in the form of a motion, um, and, and we can see how we'll address that. But the public hearing is public still, still open. Um, um, but I appreciate your comments. We will look into it. And uh, thank you for your research. Um, and we'll move on. And uh, okay. you, we'll probably be seeing you again, I assume. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank I appreciate it. Please say hi to Kathy for me. <laughs> is, uh, are, are there any other public comments at this time? Okay, seeing hey, Mr. I, Chair, um, oh, if you're going to continue yeah. part of this, you do not want to close the public okay. hearing for that part. You're continued. I will what? close the public hearing for today's matter and to, or close the public comment period for today, but keep the public hearing open uh, until uh, the item does return to us at right. a date certain in the right. future, which will be included in the motion. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd move approval of the uh, staff recommendations except as to the environmental health food vendor organizer fees in which case I want to give our staff additional, sufficient time, so I'm not sure the CAO said a week or two. It might take more than that. I'm not sure what they think they need to do that. Um, we can put an agenda item on again for three weeks out. I think okay. it would probably be a Perfect. And that, that would be my motion. Mr. Chairman. All right. So we, we have a motion by Supervisor Worthley, a second by Supervisor Cox. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, your patience and uh, for your first presentation, Tim, on this uh, in your new capacity. I hope that wasn't too painful. Um, <laughs> we will now be moving on to uh, public hearing number three, which is item number seven on our agenda, a request from the Resource Management Agency to approve uh, the 2013-2014 summary of proposed fees for planning and development in accordance with Health and Safety Code Section 17951 and Government Code Sections 54986, 56009.5, 66014, 66016, and 66451.2, beginning July 1, 2013. And I just wanted to say that because I want to make sure Julia can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um, go, go Good ahead. morning, board members. Roger Hunt, Assistant RMA Director, and hopefully the staff report is adequate in providing the explanation for the fee adjustments, and I'm available for any questions. Sure. I, I have a grave concern here uh, on the building permit fee. As I'm looking at the staff report, it's doubling the fee, and the justification that I read is because the $3.6 million spent on the general plan update. And uh, there are so much the general plan has absolutely nothing to do with building plans and building fees that I, I would see this then more as a tax than a fee, because the fee is supposed to be, as I understand it, specific to the purpose for which the person comes in and requests 
uh, a particular service from the county in order to proceed with their project. And so then we do our calculations based upon how much time and energy it takes for us to process that fee and we come up with a, with, with a fee. Here it looks like we're using some gargantuan sum spent on a very broad uh, matter, which is a general plan amendment, as a justification for doubling the permit fee. And I, I won't support that if that's, if that's the justification for it. The um, building permit fee is only applicable to the new construction. And so out of the, as an example, around 3,000 building permits issued last year, only about 413, I believe, were actually contained this uh, general plan maintenance fee. And currently it's $125. The fee was established in 1989. Oh, okay. It was recently updated in 2009. And looking at the cost of the recently adopted general plan update, uh, saw what the cost was and how it compared, knowing that the plan has to be renewed every 20 years, looking at what would be the, the cost recovery over that 20 year period. And I used uh, 700 permits with the idea that with the recession, once we get out of the recession and construction starts back up again, that we'd be anticipating numbers closer to the 700 as opposed to what was last year. I'm still struggling with the, the very premise of it because I, I, I don't see, so much of the general plan has absolutely nothing to do with building permits. So if we've adopted, a, a, if we have an existing uh, rule and an existing fee that's based upon upgrade, updating the general plan, and that's been in existence for some time, how do we end up today with a, with a doubling of the fee? Because I would think that would have been built into the fees we've been charging for years. Jake Raper, Director of Resource Management Agency. Uh, it's, it, first of all, it's not uncommon to recapture the cost of the general plan uh, update or maintenance from building permits. That's done universally throughout the cities and counties of California. When the county adopted the fee back when, uh, it was based upon <clears throat> a cost estimate for the preparation of the general plan. And in order to issue building permits, you have to have an adequate general plan or, or adopted general plan. And that is the mechanism in which to get your cost recovery is through your general plans, making findings of consistence for maps and so on. So instead of charging it for maps and, and parcel maps and so on, what we do is put it under, under the building permit provision. And therefore, based upon previous actions for the county approving subdivision maps, which requires a finding of consistency with the general plan, we put it to the building permit uh, provision or uh, association. And therefore, uh, because the general plan, plan is funded through the general fund, uh, it's a recapturing of the money expended on the general fund for uh, building permit activity. And so that's the reasoning and, and that's the approach that we have taken here in Tulare County as well as other communities in, in California. Well, let me just make this observation. If okay. I'm in a city and I have a general plan, a general plan is, is, is all within the boundaries of that city. That's correct. And most of what happens there are building projects, whether it's building a new home, building commercial buildings, that sort of thing. In a county the size of our county, where most of the construction still takes place in the city and not in the county, we're putting all the cost burden on, on the people who are outside of the cities to recover the cost of the general plan. I look at some of the, our, our costs of the general plan were caused by the cities, not by, not by construction out in the county. Uh, I mean, the, the one appeal we have was by a city. It wasn't by the, you know, it, was, it wasn't the, 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 the homeowner. I, I, I can't support this approach because it might make sense in a city, but I don't see how it makes a bit of sense in the county. So much of what we do in a general plan has to do with environmental issues, it just goes on and on. We're being sued by an environmental organization. Is it about the building of a person's home out in the countryside? Probably not. It's probably more related to some fish someplace. So I just have a real trouble finding a nexus between a building permit and a general plan update, which costs millions of dollars. I, I, I just can't support that. I just don't think it makes, I don't think it fits in this, in this situation. If we were an urbanized county, it might be, but we live in a rural county. And we just don't have that kind of construction in our county that could, I mean, if we tried to recover all of our costs for the general plan out of construction, we'd be recovering for the next two centuries, trying to recover this last time. And I, I just don't see the connection. I'm sorry. Supervisor Sheeta? I do see a, a slight connection in the MOU process we went through with the cities. And because that 
we have to we're adopting their their building codes in our UBDs or UABs. I can see the nexus there, but other than that, I don't see a nexus because that's an expense we have to go through every 20 years. So I agree with Supervisor Worthley, but I also think there's a way to recover the permitting fees for those people who are in the MOU areas that we've we've uh, agreed to I support that. Gene has a comment. Yeah, uh, Gene, uh, Gene Rousseau, County Administrative Officer. You know, I, I did struggle initially with this fee, uh, but then in talking it to uh, Mr. Hunt and the number of permits that we're going to apply it to and the amount that it's going to generate, you know, I, I, I do want to remind uh, this, the body, uh, this board, that there's a, there are a number of work programs associated with the implementation of the general plan that are, that are, that are going to require general fund dollars. The MOU that the Supervisor Sheet alludes to, when we work to adopt the city's, uh, city standards around their, their spheres, they are, they are going to be required to help pay for our time to do that. And we're not going to start doing that until they pay us to do that. But, but on this, on, on this, on the same, in the same vein, the work plans in the plan are going to require a lot of time, a lot of general fund dollars, and this is just a way to to generate uh, funds to help do that. So, you know, the, the nexus is, 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 a, is, a, is a difficult one, but it's work that we're gonna have to do one way or the other. It is applied to new permits, new growth that will, that will fall under the new general plan. And um, that's just, that's all I wanna say. Well, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I feel like we've expended these general fund monies now what we're trying to talk about, I mean, as I read this, it's very abbreviated. There's not an analysis that breaks it down. It just says we spent three and a half million dollars. We're trying to recover this money. Uh, that doesn't talk about going forward it's, it's on the implementation side. It just sounds like a justification. And I, frankly, I don't think any of us thought of that. I wasn't thinking that way. I, we knew the general plan was going to cost a lot of money. We have to have to have a general plan for anything in this county, not just for the building industry. And so I, 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 won't, I will support an analysis that talks about what it costs us to analyze and do the, what we normally do in any kind of, kind of permit. But I cannot support this uh, unless we're going to allocate a small portion towards that with, a just, with an understanding we're never going to recover all this money. It's impossible. There's not enough construction going on in the county to ever generate this kind of funds. So we're, we're engaging in, a, in something which is not going to happen. It's not, we're not going to recover three and a half million dollars from building permits in Tulare County in my lifetime or even Pete's lifetime. <laughs> so I, I just don't think we should be going down that road. And I, and I feel like this is a general plan obligation that benefits all the people of Tulare County in the cities, outside of the cities, and we're, we're saddling up only the people who are trying to construct outside in the, in the, uh, outside of the incorporated areas with this obligation, this expense. I don't think it's appropriate. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the county is required to have a general plan. The cities have their general plans as well. And so, again, the logic is if you have to make findings of consistency in the general plan, which basically parcel maps, subdivision maps, and so on, and therefore, if, if the board wishes to recover the cost of the general plan cost, not necessarily recover the cost, but look to the future in terms of updating the general plan again in the future in 20 years, then you have a revenue stream that can, that can accomplish that goal. Uh, as I recall, there's been recent legislations that, that prohibit the cities and counties from doing a what they call a maintenance fee uh, for anything. Basically, you cannot collect monies for a future event, but what you can do is collect money for uh, monies expended to accomplish that task. And this is the, the logic and the approach that we're taking. Should the board and the CAO not wish to cover the general, general fund cost of uh, preparing the general plan, then it becomes, as Mr. Russo indicates, a general fund obligation. And it, it becomes quite expensive, as the board knows, in order to maintain the general plan provide the appropriate reporting as well as preparing future amendments to the general general plan. So we need a revenue stream in which to accomplish that. So how about the RMA general budget? Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, and, and we're dependent upon Sorry, Roger, Roger, that was a real quick look right there. I was just we're very dependent that. upon the general fund on the planning branch side. So any other comments from uh, board members? 
I just got one question. Yes, How sir. How does this stack up against what other counties are charging for building permits? Uh, I, I, we haven't compared what the other counties do. However, basically every county is unique in terms of its circumstance. Our unique circumstance is that we just finished the general plan. We've caught a cost estimate of what the general plan update costs. And so that's the rationale that we utilized. And we could uh, do some explore, uh, exploration and surveys and report back to the board how they're recovering their costs on the general plan well, updates. It, and let me just make one comment, too. I mean, the, the general plan uh, update started when I was in high school. Um, and it was of no fault of your own, uh, nor I, I believe uh, any of the staff that's in place currently, um, but there were several mistakes that were made along the way, um, and that did escalate the cost of the plan, and I don't think that that's really fair to be uh, trying to recuperate those costs from uh, this segment of the population that's going to be building things. But I'll look at yeah, uh, Gene Rousseau, uh, CEO, once, once again, we can do what we just did with, with the Health and Human Services. If this is the only fee that you have an issue with, we can hold off approving this we can until we bring back information from our uh, jurisdictions around us what other counties and quite frankly cities are doing relative to these fees it's my understanding that the cities are charging a general plan fee uh, or their permits include a portion of the general plan maintenance so we can we'll, mm -hmm. we'll do some research bring this particular fee back keep the hearing open okay. so on and uh, if that's the uh, the desire of the board. I, I appreciate that, and I personally uh, would be more supportive of a maintenance fee that is based upon a, a sum that's not going to double the fee, that kind of a thing. You know, so if there's a smaller portion that goes towards maintenance, I understand maintenance does cost money. So we, I, I, what I, the way I'm kind of looking at it is, we bit the bullet from general fund. We paid for the general plan. It's a done deal almost, and that's been done. I don't want to saddle future builders with that obligation but the ongoing maintenance of that plan is, is another matter I could see where we would I, I, I could be more supportive of something like that but I, I I really don't like this concept of just saying hey we spent three and a half million dollars we need to recover it so. okay well this is a public hearing and I will go ahead and open the public hearing because we haven't even started it yet um, but we'll go ahead and open the public hearing now is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on the RMA portion of these fee increases this morning Okay, seeing no one, I will bring it back to the board for action, but we will be keeping this uh, public hearing open, I assume. I would like to also ask the board to make the, if you approve the rates, to make it contingent upon the auditor's approval of the methodology. I had provided the information to them too late uh, for them to have given me a decision on that. Okay. But, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Mr. I'd move approval of the proposed fees with the exception of the... Uh, uh, building permit fees, uh, which we can bring back in three weeks adequate time for that. It would be June 4th, the 28th, our meeting is canceled. Okay, second that. <coughs> Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you thank very much, you, Roger. You. Appreciate that. All right, we are now going to move on to the next public hearing on our agenda, which does not include a fee increase. Um, and that is a public hearing from the Resource Management Agency to approve the categorical exemption pursuant to 14 Cal Code Regs, Section 15305, Class 5, pertaining to, go ahead, Mike, that's a long paragraph. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members Thank of the you. board, Mr. Rousseau, Council. Um, the matter before you is a uh, proposed tentative subdivision map number 826 to divide 183 acres into four lots in the AE20 zone. Um, I will expedite my presentation today. Uh, just please note that the Planning Commission approved this tentative map on March 13th, 2013, without any opposition whatsoever. Uh, locationally, the proposed project is on the west side of Road 28, approximately one half mile south of Avenue 232, Kansas Avenue, west of Tulare. With regard to CEQA, the matter was uh, approved based upon two exemptions the minor land division, as well as the general rule uh, exemption. There were no adverse comments. The matter was thoroughly analyzed, as indicated in your uh, packet, and so the California Environmental Quality Act has been satisfied. With regard to the general plan, 
The subject property is designated Valley Agriculture, and based upon the analysis, there will be no adverse impact to economic viability of agriculture, and thus the general plan uh, consistency requirement is met. With regard to zoning consistency, the subject property is located in the AE40 zone, exclusive ag, 40 acre minimum. Uh, three of the four lots meet that requirement. The remaining lot qualifies under the homestead uh, or the uh, home site exemption. With regard to subdivision map act compliance, um, the act is complied with in light of the uh, successive subdivisions that have occurred uh, previously. Finally, concerning the Williamson Act, the subject property is consistent with the act in that uh, the property will continue to be used for agriculture, the parcel size is appropriate, and the length of ownership is greater than 10 years. Therefore, the requested action is number one, hold the public hearing, uh, which was duly noticed. Secondly, to approve the CEQA categorical <coughs> exemptions. Three, to conditionally approve tenant of the BAP number 826. And finally, to authorize the environmental assessment officer to file the appropriate notice of exemption with the Tulare County Clerk. Thank you, that completes my presentation. Any questions or comments from board members? Okay, at this time I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak to this item? Seeing no one, I will bring it back. I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the board for comment and action. Move for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Supervisor Ennis, a second from Supervisor Ashita. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That was a lot easier than the uh, maintenance fees, right? <laughs> okay. We're going to move on now to uh, item number nine, which is a public hearing, a request from the Resource Management Agency relating to the California First Program. Mr. Washam. Good, mo <clears throat> Good morning. I'll expedite my presentation as well. <laughs> going on. Uh, Mike Washam, Economic Development Manager for Tulare County. Uh, today we're here for uh, uh, consideration of uh, joining California First uh, PACE program. Pull the microphone around in front of you, Mike. Sorry. <clears throat> the uh, PACE program is an alternative to a loan uh, for financing uh, energy efficiency uh, equipment and, and upgrades. Uh, the amount borrowed is repaid through a special assessment rather than a, uh, a normal loan and it's paid on the property owner's tax roll each year. Uh, it, PACE allows an, a, a, an additional way of financing uh, uh, these types of improvements and it can ultimately reduce operating costs for a business. PACE is completely voluntary. Only properties that are um, within a jurisdiction that has chosen to opt into a PACE program may receive this type of financing. Your board on January 29th directed the Resource Management Agency to prepare the required documents to allow County of Tulare to join the PACE program offered through California First and return to your board with an opt-in resolution for its consideration. That's why we're here today. I'll briefly go through these. We've talked about these in the past. The benefits of PACE for the commercial property owners. Essentially, there's no upfront costs and the payback can be over 20 years paid on their tax roll. What this does is it's off the book. There's no additional debt load and it's treated like any other property tax or assessment. The benefits to actually the mortgage lenders, it's a mechanism that's, that's well understood and it actually uh, increases the value of the collateral uh, so, so they're, they're, uh, they look uh, gladly upon these uh, projects and it helps uh, need, they're allowed to make capital improvements on the properties without, without additional debt. So the mortgage holders uh, view this as a positive financing. And what, what, what are the benefits for the county itself? Helps promote job creation and economic development. Uh, it removes the historic barriers, the, the high cost to uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy installations. And it helps achieve our greenhouse uh, gas reduction goals for the county. And just a reminder, it's not a government subsidy and no, no Tulare County general fund uh, exposure. There's two major concerns that, uh, surrounding the PACE program. First was uh, on residential properties. This uh, program will be available only to commercial property 
including multifamily uh, five units and more, would not accept application from residential property owners until such time as the issues raised by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are resolved to the satisfaction of county council. Uh, and secondly, since the uh, these assessments have priority over pre-existing mortgages, each property owner must obtain written acknowledgement from all mortgage holders on, on the property prior to approval of, of this type of financing. Just a few points to consider. Um, no liability or exposure to the general fund, as I mentioned. Uh, the county can withdraw from the program at any time by passing a resolution um, rescinding the authorization. The county is free to develop and, and operate other financing programs, including alternate PACE programs. And pursuant to the direction from the board back on January 29th, uh, the Economic Development Office will be bringing an alternative PACE program forward in, for consideration in the month of June. Uh, we have a representative from Structured Finance who will be that other um, uh, organization that, that will be bringing forward a, a, another plan. Um. For California First, we received a number of support letters from uh, Chambers, the City of Tulare, City of Visalia, the EDC, uh, letters of support uh, encouraging the county to uh, opt into the California First program. With that, uh, we request that the uh, Board of Supervisors conduct a public hearing. Uh, find that the adoption of a resolution to enter into California First program is not a project under the California uh, Environmental Quality Act and adopt the resolution authorizing the County of Tulare to join the California First program. With that, I conclude my presentation. Any questions from board members? Okay, I will open the public hearing. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? Okay, seeing no one, I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the board for action Move and approval, question Mr. comment. Okay, we have a motion by second. Supervisor Worthley and a second by Supervisor Cox to approve this request. Uh, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. All right. That concludes our timed items portion of our meeting. We will now move on to uh, the untimed portion of our agenda. Uh, item 38 is a request from the Health and Human Services Agency to approve the personnel resolution uh, to add one Deputy Director, Human Resources Division, and delete one Division Manager, Human Resources Division. Dr. Dirksen. Good morning, Good Chairman morning. Vanderpool, members of the board, Mr. Russo and uh, Ms. Roberts. Um, we are specifically requesting today to make uh, several changes to our Human Resources Division. Those include the addition of a deputy director position, the deletion of the current division manager position, um, the approval of a new job description for the deputy director position, and then obviously the budget uh, adjustment form. Um, the request of the boards consist, uh, is consistent with recommendations from a review and analysis we took up approximately um, a year ago. We looked at business processes, workflow history, resource allocation, et cetera. Um, and it's also reflective of our continued effort to improve organizational performance uh, and enhancement at all levels of the organization, including uh, service delivery to our own employees. I should also just add by way of closing before I take questions that the recent division manager uh, has retired. And so at least from my particular perch and perspective, it's, it's perhaps a timely request to make that change. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions you might have. Any questions from board members? Any questions from members of the public? <coughs> Seeing none, this is a board item for action. Move approval. We have a motion by Supervisor Ishida, a second by Supervisor Ennis. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. See what happens when you don't Thank bring you. us fees? It's, yeah, it's I was going to say it's much easier than environmental okay. health. So. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it, Dr. Thursday. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Um, next, we're going to move on to item 39, a request from Resource Management Agency to approve the submission of the grant application to the California Access Program for Roadway Improvements to Success Valley Drive. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Reed Shanky. I'm an engineer with the Resource Management Agency. I'll just real quickly go over a new funding, federal funding source for transportation improvement projects, um, at the end of which I'll make a request for your authorization to submit a grant uh, for this program. 
the new, this new program is the California Access Program. Um, it's established as part of MAP 21, which is federal legislation that was enacted by Congress about a year ago. Um, unlike a majority of our county federally funded projects, this project is implemented and administered by Central Federal Lands Highway Division, which is part of FHWA, Department of Transportation. Um, the majority of our other projects are administered through Caltrans, so this is a little bit different here. Um, federal highways will use this, will be forming a transportation improvement program list, and they will be designing and constructing, so they will be responsible for the, this project. These projects will be for our, the local agencies or the potential recipients for these fundings. Um, so the, the intent of this project or this program is to enhance or make improvements to projects or facilities that provide access or are adjacent to federal lands. Um, the funding requires a about 11.5% local match and the emphasis is on high use federal recreational sites or economic generators. Um, this projects will be evaluated by the Federal Highways Division um, based on the items shown here, some of which are access, which would be providing alternative modes of transportation like bike lanes, that sort of thing, um, safety, facility condition, and then a big one is coordination with the Federal Lands Agency um, or the property owner that is uh, adjacent to our facility. Um, the process we went through to identify which project we wanted to submit for application for this program um, was a fairly, uh, it was a multi-step process, but it wasn't too complicated. We first off identified all the various federal land management agencies in Tulare County. Um, these include the obvious sources like uh, National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, but some of the less obvious would um, be like the BLM, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers which uh, operates and maintains Lake Success, Lake Cahuilla. Um, once we identified the federal lands, we looked at the different facilities that were adjacent to these properties, and then we narrowed that list down to facilities that were in need of improvements. Um, we narrowed down this list with a consultation with our various RMA departments and also with the various uh, federal lands agencies that were uh, owning those adjacent properties to determine what their level of support would be. There, the, after going through that list, we narrowed it down to about four projects here, shown here, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slides. First potential project was Success Valley Drive. This is in between State Route 190 and the Thule Recreation uh, Area at Lake Success. Uh, the federal land there is operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. And this is a little less than a quarter mile stretch of road that provides access for um, camping and then also lake access. Uh, the second project or potential project would be Mountain Road 99, otherwise known as the Kern River Highway. This is a county facility that runs just north of Kernville at the county line up to Johnsondale. It's in uh, U.S. Forest Service land, but it is a county facility. Uh, it's about 21 miles of roadway, but the facility itself needs a little over 10 miles or so of improvements, either overlays or reconstructions, maybe some shoulder widenings there. Third project or potential project would have been or was the Mountain Road 375A. This is Mineral King Drive going up from State Route 198 near Three Rivers to the Mineral King entrance of Sequoia Park. Um, it's a narrow, call it maybe a one and a half lane road. Um, needs some pretty significant improvements as far as reconstruction um, just to delay uh, maintenance issues that are there. Um, and that federal land is administered by the National Park Service. The fourth project was the kind of iconic Mineral King Bridge over the Cahuilla River. This is on the Mineral King Drive as well, provides access to the National Park, the Mineral King entrance there. Um, we decided after a little bit of discussion to remove this project from the list because it's currently um, programmed to be reconstructed or rehabilitated as part of the county's highway bridge program, which is a federally, run, fun, federally funded program, uh, similar local match, similar constraints there. Um, but we would be the uh, more of a lead agency on that one. We would have more design decisions um, and more input versus 
with this uh, California Access Program. Uh, we've currently scheduled this one for rehabilitation in about four years. So we took this off the list. Uh, the resulting list here shows the three projects, Success Valley Drive, Kern River Highway, and Mineral King Drive. You can see briefly what the scope of the project is and what the usage is. ADT is um, average daily traffic, so you get between 200 and 500 uh, vehicles crossing these roadways. The significant issue or most telling point of this slide is the costs. The two on the bottom are fairly long stretches and thus fairly high dollar, where a Success Valley Drive is about a quarter mile and preliminary cost estimates have it a little bit under $300,000. The local match there would be that $33,000. Um, so that's kind of the distinguishing factor between the three. Um, we selected or are hoping to select and propose to you um, submitting the Success Valley Drive project as part of this uh, grant proposal. We feel it has the highest benefit cost ratio of the three various projects. Um, it's got the most use by county residents. For example, the Kern River Highway, a lot of the access there is from residents or businesses in Kernville, which is in Kern County there. Um, so the Success Valley Drive is centrally located within the county here. Uh, it's got year-round use. The Mineral King Road is more or less seasonal. The, the gates for the Mineral King entrance at the National Park um, close during winter snowfall from about October to May. We've got uh, the lowest county cost, and we feel it's the highest probability for selection by these grant evaluators. A little detail about the Success Valley Drive project. It's currently about 20 feet wide, which is narrower than what standard roadways for this type of facility would be. We propose to widen it to 32 feet, which would include two four-foot uh, bike lanes on either side of the road there, um, reconstruct the road base and the road surface, and install facility signage and possibly landscaping to improve the aesthetics and the visibility of that facility, which would also benefit the, the Army Corps uh, here. The estimated cost, again, is um, about 288000 33,000 of which would be local funds, and at this point we're proposing that it would be, that that money would be coming out of the roads fund. Um, so that's kind of just a brief discussion of the project there and a couple pictures. You can see the campsite right adjacent to the road, and the current status of the road is pretty bad. It's pretty beaten up. The next steps of this project is, with your approval, we'll submit the grant application. It's actually due today by midnight. Um, if the project is selected for the improvement pro program, um, the county and the federal lands will establish a detailed scope, budget, and work agreement, at which point they will take off running with it and design and then implement by constructing the project with county oversight. Um, their stated goals are to complete these projects that are on this tip within the next five to seven years. So it could be two years, three years, could be as many as seven years out. Uh, with that, if you have any questions, I'm open to that, and otherwise the request is on the board here. Supervisor Ishida. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> on Success Valley Drive project, it says lowest county costs 11.5% match from road funds. Yes. What's the match on the other projects? The, the, this program requires an 11.5% match for all the projects. So if you look at the table, here, we're looking at 1.2 million or 1.4 million for the other two projects. The question I have is if we have projects that are in the million dollar range and we only have 11% match, why aren't we going after the larger projects? These generally, we're looking at 20 to 25% matches on all these other programs. The 11.47% match is, there's, it's either that or a 20% match with most federal funded transportation programs. So you're right, this is on the lower scale there. We felt that being that this is a, a new program, we wanted to um, not dive in head first per se. And the $1.2 million of these other two projects potentially create a, a funding issue because we hadn't had those in our previous budgets. It, potentially Major R would be a source of that funding, but we would have to go to them to, to request that, and that sort of um, amount wasn't necessarily on their, their budget as well. 
You know, if you look at, let's say Mineral King Road Drive, if you commit to that project 12.3 million, does that mean it has to reach all the way to the, the gates of the park? Or it, did we do a portion of that road? We can do a portion. It, this, this process involves, once we're selected for the improvement program, um, discussions with federal highways as far as developing the scope of that project. What this uh, one, this, for the Mineral King Road, the 10.5 million project includes about five miles of overlay and two miles of widening. That isn't the entire length of the project. That's kind of the worst of the worst part there. Of, at least we have residents on that part. Yeah, particularly on the lower section of that road. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very possible that because this could happen anywhere from two to seven years, there would be multiple trips to Washington required. And if that's the case, I'd nominate sending Supervisor <laughs> Sheeta for those trips. He enjoys it there. I think they're administrator they're administered out of Colorado. Of so. <laughs> the, the other question I have, mainly, it's too late. At this point in time, we filed tonight by midnight on this project. Is there any backfill coming in the future? There's potential once they um, identify, they've got a certain amount of budget and I think it's somewhere in the realm of $300 million for um, the state of California. So there is potential that if they don't get enough projects submitted, then they would do a second round to increase or ask for additional projects. Well, I'm, I'm just, Rather disappointed. That's all we're asking for. Supervisor Worthy. Well, I, I, I was going to kid you and say, do you have three different applications ready to go so we can pick <laughs> among the choose three? I'm just joking because I'm sure that's not the case. But I, I do kind of echo well, uh, Supervisor Sheeta's comments, which is, I wish we had something maybe in between, you know, a, a three hundred thousand dollar project and a, an eleven or twelve million dollar project. Uh, I, this is a competitive bid process, correct? Um, and you just made the comment there's like 300 million allocated for California, I think you said. Um, personally, and, and time, of course, is of the essence here, but if we get another shot at this, I'd rather us try to get more. Anytime you can get somebody else to pay for 89% of your project, usually you want to try to get the most of it you possibly can. And then, and since we have a three to five year period, a window to work out the finances of it, we could, we could be looking. I, I just turned to the supervisor. Cox here, where you're talking about a, a bicycle lane. Well, part of Measure R is for bicycle lanes. I mean, so we could be looking at funding sources that could help pay for these ex some of these expenses, some of our match that would come not just necessarily have our road fund. But the idea that you can get, again, a 10 or $12 million worth of work done and only have to come up with a $1.2 million, I realize that's a lot of money, but it's a lot of road work done at the same time. And, and I think that's what, as we look at Measure R, that's what we've been able to do is is get more of other people to pay for projects in our county with with our matching sum, and because otherwise, if we're going to go out there and fix these roads ourselves, they aren't going to ever get done. Uh, again, in Pete's lifetime, probably. So anyway, I, I think the concept going forward, I realize today's is, is, is uh, we don't really have that option, but going forward, I'd like for us to maybe, if we have opportunity, look at bigger projects and then work on the financing part of it, given the fact we don't have to come up with all at one time. Right, three to five years, something like that, or five part, to seven years, something like that. If I can, part of the the evaluation criteria is they're more willing to fund or add to the list projects that already have funding in place. Okay, and those are some of the things I was. You know, I mean, we didn't get all that. I, my assumption was when we thought this had the highest rate of being successful, maybe the other part was not going to be successful because we asked for so much money, or we didn't have the match in hand, or something of that of that nature. And you you have more uh, access to that information than we have. But yeah. But I think you understand. I believe the policy of the board here. Whenever we can get, like I said, someone else to pay for almost ninety percent of a project, we want to try to get you know the most we possibly can and work Absolutely. out the finances of it uh, some other way. Absolutely. I think part of the other factor looking at that cost benefit was these are, you know, we've got 200 ADT on a lot of these facilities right. and to look at that benefit cost analysis versus potentially other projects that other agencies are submitting, these may fall lower on the scale there. Well, and I hopefully Mr. Raper will be looking a little bit more closely at the BLM land out by Alpa after the drive out there to see the solar farm that he took last week. Just making that plug. Go ahead. <laughs> I agree. Well, I think we aimed a little bit low. 
um, and nothing being your fault here, uh, a concern I have is this happens to us a lot. Uh, we get left out of the the pre-thought process, looking at the you know entire list. You narrowed your list down to four. If, was it 20? Was it 30? You know, I think this board ought to have a chance to look at the the list of 30 and have early input so that when you get here, you know, we don't beat you up. But sure. I, I think we did aim awful low on this, and, and I would like to see in the future if we have this opportunity, bring it to us as soon as you can. Let us look at the big list, give you some feedback, and then come back with a narrow list. Absolutely. But, Mr. Chairman, but I will say that this road is much needed in the success, and these improvements will make it a lot, especially with maybe the restrictions coming off the dam. You're going to see a lot more people using this road. So this is much needed for that area. That's great. It's a quarter mile long. It's your good works fund. <laughs> Supervisor Ennis. That's what right. I, is that is that the form of is that works. the form of a motion, Supervisor Ennis? <laughs> yeah, that would be a motion. Okay, so there's a motion for approval from Supervisor Ennis. Second. A second from Supervisor Worthley. Please vote. Hey, see, even when you're not raising fees, it can be difficult at times. So. <laughs> Thank you. Just know we don't discriminate. Um, <laughs> next, we're going to take up our final item on our open session agenda, and that's item number 40, a request from Resource Management Agency to authorize the extension of the closure of the Kennedy Meadows Transfer Station to June 30th, 2013. Another one. Go ahead, Denise. Another. Good morning, Board, CAO, and Council. Denise Aiken, CAO Office. Uh, your board, since August 28th of 2012, has taken numerous actions regarding this transfer station. First, authorizing its closure and then authorizing um, extensions to the closure date. The most recent was on April 2nd, where your board authorized closure effective 30 days, which would be this Thursday. Since um, the August 28th meeting and again since the April 2nd meeting, uh, staff has been working diligently with the concerned residents of Kennedy Meadows to identify a viable effective solution for their solid waste needs. On April 12, 2013, um, staff met with the Kennedy Meadows Community Committee um, that was selected back in October at their original community meeting um, to discuss the fee that was going to be applied to their tax roll, a land use fee. Um, that fee was presented to the committee as about $20 per month per residential parcel, which equates to two, about $240 a year. The committee was supportive of the fee um, however, they identified some parcels that they felt were developed that were benefiting from the transfer station that should also pay the land use fee. And um, so staff is working to identify additional parcels. We have identified a timeline. So currently we're using um, well logs to identify domestic wells um, and comparing that to the parcel list we got from the assessor's office to identify missing parcels. We're also using records from the Ducor Telephone Company, assuming if they get telephone service at the parcel, they most likely are also using the transfer station. Um, and then we will hold a community meeting on May 18th, 2013, to determine the full community support coming back to your board on May 21st, to schedule a public hearing for July 16th, at which you will hear the um, Prop 218 protest process to establish the land use fee. Therefore, we we're requesting um, an extension to July 17th, the day after the public hearing, <laughs> to extend the closure. And I will take any uh, comments or questions. Any comments or questions? Well, I've just got one comment. I mean, we've, we've talked and we've had conference calls with these folks, and I think that they're, I think we're heading in the right direction now. And I think we just need to give them this chance to put it on their tax rolls and pay for it. Supervisor Cox. How much have we collected in our tree box? We're collecting about $200 a month from the box. What does it cost us per month? It's costing in the neighborhood of uh, the operations of just the transfer station is about 20000 a year, so divided by 12, about a couple That's thousand a year, a, a month. <laughs> Sounds like transit. Yeah. yeah. We're asking them to also, um, in the part land use fee, we're asking them to also cover the environmental costs of the site. So it would be full cost recovery. All right. Is that the form of a motion I hear down there, Supervisor Ennis? I would make a motion to delay the Supervisor Sheeta, would you like to comment? Yeah, before I second this, I want a date definitive to where they come up with an agreement because in that 
staff report, it says they've recognized parcels that weren't included in the list. Well, hell, that list can go on for, t for the next five years trying to determine who's going to be assessed and not assessed. So there needs to be a date certain with additions to the assessment as needed. Yeah. But so, don't go through this period no. of trying to determine who's going to be assessed right. for the next five years. So yeah. May 18th, of analysis. Yeah, May 18th Analyze would have that uh, that yes. list. And so May 21st, when I come, you'll be able to to see some some concrete action. And at that time, you can either decide to close it if they won't support it, or decide to let that yeah, process I'll go I'll forward. The okay, so we have a motion and a second, but we have one additional comment one, before we vote. One last question, two part. What's the cost of the election of the vote, and who's going to pay for it? Uh, the solid waste division will pay for it and it would be the cost of mailing out the 200 and some notices general fund no 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 solid waste enterprise fund tipping fee money <laughs> <laughs> okay so we have a motion by supervisor ennis a second by supervisor shito please vote although mr Schirmer, i did consider thinking we should just close the facility it might help facilitate the vote outcome yeah it might speed it up <laughs> <laughs> that 30-day notice well, certainly I understand that. And the process. all right well um that concludes our open portion of our board of supervisors meeting today uh council do we have need for a closed session yes mr chair we do have need for closed session it's items a b and d as listed on your agenda we are going to cancel item c i do not expect to report out Okay, that sounds good. Thank you everyone for attending today's meeting and hope everyone has a great week. This meeting is adjourned. Hey, Michelle. Michelle. Perfect. Hey, just, oh. You didn't have to put the whole in. Just this. Just, if you could just put this for the sheet each meeting, that would be great for me. Oh, yeah, only a couple of them. Oh, I've been holding <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you let us? Yeah, if I can find the clicker. <laughs>